Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all for being here. Tony, let's take the roll. Jimenez? Torres? Present. Cohen? Here. Ortiz? Present. Davis? Duan? Candelas? Here. Foley? Here. Batra? Present. Kame? Here. Mahan? Here. You Welcome to everyone to this. Oh, thank you. Councilor Jimenez is here as well as the open session of the City Council for November 14th. And now if you're able, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, justice for liberty. Today's invocation will be given by San Jose Anmol Satsang, and Council Member Batra will tell us more. Dear Mayor and Council Members, for my second invocation, I have invited a neighborhood community satsang group from D10. The word satsang from the Sanskrit means the gathering of good people for the performance of devotional activities. This group believes in the knowledge and wisdom enshrined in the Indian scriptures on the connectedness and interdependence of all human beings. The devotees pray for peace, love, and happiness for their families, communities, and all human beings. The invocation team will invoke today the divine's blessings to bestow wisdom on the city mayor and the council members to make decisions for the well-being of all the people of San Jose, the country, and the planet. This group was started in 1977 by four Indian families who migrated to the US and settled in the beautiful city of San Jose. The informally formed group did not construct a temple, did not build a gurdwara, but has regarded the homes of the members as temples, gurdwaras, and rotate the monthly gatherings at each of the members' homes. The meetings are held on one Sunday of every month to sing devotional songs. The members of this group often attend Hindu temples, gurdwaras, Jain temples, formal places of worship available in the Bay Area now. However, the group remains vibrant, attracting new members from the next generations as older members move on or leave. The practice of meeting once a month at the homes of the members continues. Even during the pandemic, the group met regularly on Zoom. Some of the satsangis have joined us in person or online to witness and participate this blissful event at the city of San Jose. I request the team of Sheetal Singhal, Aruna Sood, and Renu Arora to perform the invocation at our council chambers. Thank you. On behalf of our satsang or prayer group community and fellow residents, of the wonderful city of San Jose, we thank Council Member Batra, Mayor Mehan, all council members, staff members for inviting us to pray together with them as they begin the work of the people today. As longtime residents of this city, our families have been part of and witnessed to the highly commendable growth from a sleepy small town to a vibrant city third largest in California and the 12th largest in the USA. We take pride in the fact that San Jose has a diverse population where people live in harmony and support each other, thus making this a great place to raise a family. Our city is also known as one of the world's greatest innovation hubs, which makes it attractive to live and work in. We pray to the divine to bestow upon us the wisdom 
and intellect to become a community that is just and compassionate, always standing up for good over evil and choosing knowledge over ignorance. We pray that these virtues ha will help make our city the safest, cleanest, and the greenest city, and will serve as a role model city for the world. Today we will chant a few mantras, first to Lord Ganesha, remover of all obstacles, then the Gayatri mantra, considered to be one of the most powerful mantras and is an expression of gratitude and praise to the powers of transformation, inner growth, and self-realization provided by the radiant light of the divine. We pray for the well-being of our city and all of its residents. Vakratunda Mahakaya Surya Koti Samaprabhat Nirvignam Kurume Deva Sarvakaya Shusarvada Sri Ganeshai Namaha Om Bhurbhava Swaha Tat Savitur Vareniyam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Dhiyo Yona Prachodaya Om Bhurbhava Swaha Tat Savitur Vareniyam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Dhiyo Yona Prachodaya Om Bhurbhava Swaha Tat Savitur Vareniyam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Dhiyo Yona Prachodaya Om Om Astoma Sadgamaya Tamsoma Jyotirgamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. All right, we are on to ceremonial items. We will start with Council Member Ortiz and Council Member Candelas. If you would join me at the podium, we will recognize and proclaim American Diabetes Month. Hello, everybody. Let me just raise this a little bit. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, November is American Diabetes Month, a time to promote awareness of a serious disease with potential life-threatening complications. One in 10 Americans have diabetes. Of that group, one in five don't know that they have it. And approximately one in three American adults have pre-diabetes. These numbers are only increasing, and diabetes doesn't affect everyone equally. It is significantly more prominent amongst communities of color, and particularly the black, indigenous, and Latino communities. So this month, it is an important time to raise awareness of diabetes, encourage our residents to monitor their diabetes and pre-diabetes risk, and advocate that all of our communities can afford and access insulin and the resources they need to manage the disease. I'm honored to present this proclamation to the Community Health Partnerships, which represents all our city and county's amazing community health centers. 
which are on the front lines in giving our working families the robust care they need to fight di diabetes and all other health concerns. Now I'd like to invite Dolores Alvarado, CEO of Community Health Partnerships, to give a few words. Thank you. Oh, great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure and my honor to be here representing the community health centers of both Santa Clara County and San Mateo County. I'm humbled to address the, the honorable members of the council, including the mayor, of course, and special thanks to you, uh, excuse me, councilman, I always call him assemblyman, yeah. council member uh, Ortiz, yeah. I know, like, <laughs> or congress or something. Yeah. Uh, we're acknowledging uh, diabetes and bringing it to this level because that's what it's going to take to take care of it. Um, with us today, I'd like to introduce a couple of uh, very important groups. Today is the executive staff from Gardner Family Health Center, uh, been in this county for over 60 years. We're starting with the current CEO, Mr. Rafael Vaquerano, who's behind me. The uh, um, past CEO, uh, CEO Emeritus, Raimundo Espinosa, who was with, yes, who was with uh, Gardner for over 35 years, um, as well as a med medical director who's been their director for about 30 years, and that's Dr. Shonda Muli. I also have with me Sarita Coley, who's the CEO of Aki, a community health center that was started 40 years ago to um, serve some of the Asian immigrants during the Vietnam War, et cetera. Uh, and then behind me is the most excellent staff. We have several community health workers, community health educators, masters prepared folks who conduct a lot of self-management and pre-prevention services for our community, particularly for the patients of our clinics. So they are all in the back. If you could raise your hands. Di <laughs> Diabetes is deadly an expensive chronic disease that continues to impact our community health centers patients and all of us, as you well pointed it out. Uh, for example, the rate of adults diagnosed with diabetes at the community health centers is higher than the county, higher than the state. The county is about 9.6%, roughly 10%, not a good rate, but better than before. Our clinics range between 11% and 17%. Now, what's noteworthy about this is the fact that there's a strong relationship between poverty and high rates of diabetes. So that's where we really need to target our efforts. Experts agree that the only way to address diabetes and other chronic diseases is to mobilize the communities that are most impacted, have them own and come up with, the, with their own decisions. Coupled with clinical intervention, that's why the clinics are here, health education, that's why our health educators are here, and policy, policy and legislation. That's why you are all here. So perfect combination. Uh, we refer this from the public health perspective as a spectrum of prevention. There is no one cure. There are many cures that have to come together. Finally, I've taken the liberty of bringing flyers and announcing our next cohort of diabetes self-management classes. Each of the office should have a packet, um, as well as our most recent directory. I'm happy to send you the e-copy e so you can post it on your website, share it with your constituents. We provide services in many languages for, for self-management, English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. And again, thank you very much to the members of the City Council, and special thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dolores. Now I ask the mayor to please present the commendation, and we will take a picture.
All right, Council Member Foley, if you'd like to join me at the podium, we will recognize and proclaim World Day of Remembrance. I'm here to proclaim November 19th as World Day of Remembrance alongside, well, I was gonna be alongside Vision Zero Vice Chair Bien Duong, but he's unavailable at the moment. In 2005, the United Nations adopted World Day of Remembrance in acknowledgement of victims of road traffic crashes and their families. This event is a somber remembrance of the lives that were needlessly lost in preventable crashes within our city. Last year was the deadliest year on San Jose's roads. We lost 65 community members in 2022 and have lost 45 community members this year, all to roadway fatalities. These people are not just data points. Their parents, grandparents, children, siblings, friends, and neighbors. Every life taken due to road traffic crashes is a tragedy that ripples out to many more people. It's important to recognize that every single fatality on our roadway is a tragedy and that these crashes, not accidents, are entirely preventable. This is also an issue of equity as the corridors with the highest number of pedestrian deaths are also in some of our most disadvantaged communities. In 2015, the city of San Jose became a vision zero city with a commitment to prioritize street safety with the goal of reducing traffic fatalities to zero. We're not even close. Unfortunately, we've not met that promise and as a city, we need to do better. As this year's World Day of Remembrance theme is remember, support, act, we take the time today to remember those who who we have lost to preventable crashes. We support the families and communities personally impacted. We support all the crucial work of our emergency services and continue to advocate to increase funding to add additional traffic enforcement units to our police force. We act by continuing to advocate for increased funding for infrastructure changes to our streets designed to reduce speeds and save lives. Today, we are presenting this proclamation to Gina LeBlanc, who is a member of the Families for Safe Streets. She is joined by her husband, Steve. And take a moment to remember her son, Kyle LeBlanc. Families for Safe Streets was founded in 2014 by the families of loved ones who were killed or injured in crashes and has grown into a national movement. These individuals tirelessly advocate for life-saving changes to our roadways while supporting others who have been impacted by crashes. Our work is far from complete, as there is still much more that we need to do to make our streets safer for everyone. I hope that everyone will continue to be engaged while we work through making San Jose a city for people rather than a city for cars. And remember, San Jose, please slow down. In closing, let us continue to hold dear and cherish the memories of those we have lost. These needless deaths can be prevented. The answer is in our control. As we continue to work together for a safer environment for all of us. Mayor, would you please present the proclamation to Gina and Steve LeBlanc. And Gina, I'd like you to say a few words. Okay, am I talking first? Oh, okay. <laughs> I have to talk first. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, um, council member. Um, yes, we're, we're here to remember actually the hundreds of people who've died since we adopted Vision Zero in 2015, hundreds and hundreds. We're over 400 now, I'm sure. Um, and there's also thousands of members of our community who've been injured in traffic violence that are suffering from chronic pain. You may not hear about them because they're not reported, but it's, it's in the thousands. Um, 
But I wanted to tell you about my son, Kyle, because I get this opportunity. <laughs> um, this is a photo of, of him. He had just turned 18 and was looking forward to being the DJ at his Valentine's dance. Prom and high school graduation were coming up, too. I'd put together a slideshow to play at his graduation party. Kyle was creative and brilliant, full of endless energy. It was like living with a supernova. He was an inventor, our little Thomas Edison. He was only five when he built his first electrical circuit, just like Iron Man. He built 12 computers from scratch, from junk parts, networked them all together in his bedroom. Our lights went out. He created his own cloud. Um, he was looking forward to studying computer networking in college and had the dream of one day working for Google. Three weeks after his 18th birthday, Kyle was walking to the Kirtner Light Rail Station in San Jose when he was killed by the driver of a tow truck. Kyle never came home. He left a half-eaten bag of popcorn on his bed that after seven years, I still can't throw away. It must be the mommy and me, wishing he will come home to finish the popcorn, but I know he never will. And the slideshow I just made for graduation was played at his funeral. I've always wondered what amazing creation Kyle would have invented for all of us, and now we will never know. As Councilmember Foley said, these crashes on our streets, like Kyle's, are not inevitable, they're preventable. And they're not accidents, they're crashes. There are three parts to World Day of Remembrance, as you heard, remember, support, and act. It is not enough just to remember. So I'm here to ask the city leaders in San Jose to act and act urgently. A few months ago, the city of San Mateo announced they would reduce speeds in 13 school zones to 15 miles per hour. Last month, San Francisco declared they would institute no right turn on red citywide. Well, where is San Jose's bold declaration? We can do this too. Where is our action? Why is safe mobility not a top priority in our city? My son was just trying to access public transit, and he shouldn't have to be killed on the way. This year, I was in Sacramento advocating with Families for Safe Streets for our cam speed camera pilot program, um, which passed, yay. Um, but I have heard that because of city bureaucracy, it may not be till 2025 or later till we start this program. And I urge you, whatever we can do, to get this going next year so we can save lives. We have the tools to make our streets safer, but we need the leaders on board and we need to act with urgency. All of these people who've lost their lives or have been injured by traffic violence on our streets matter. Kyle matters. Please act now. Thank you. And Councilmember Dewan, if you'd like to stay here, we will recognize Selena Nguyen. Selena, come on down. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for being here. Today, it is my distinct honor to present a commendation to a remarkable individual who has exemplified the outstanding leadership and community dedication. Selena Nguyen, a student at Andrew Hill High School, has not only set an inspiring example for her peers, but also made a significant impact on our community through her initiative, the Gold Star Volleyball Program, for, girl, for girls aged from 11 to 14 at Seven Tree Community Center. Selena's commitment to this program goes far beyond the technical aspect of volleyball. She has taken upon herself to provide these young girls the crucial emotional support and guidance, nurturing their development, and not just athletes, but as future leaders. What truly set Selena apart from her unyield unyielding determination She's actively raising funds 
for program essential showing over. Her visionary outlook extend beyond the present as she envision expanding this program in upcoming years with the inclusion of professional coach, ensuring its sustainability and growth. But Selena's extraordinary contribution do not end there. She is a dedicated Girl Scout, actively participating in a community organization that values service and leadership. She also shares her cultural heritage by teaching the Vietnamese language at Ve Nguyen, Vietnamese school, bringing generational and cultural gaps. Her dedication to personal development is an evidence in her practice of Vovinam martial arts, a testament to her commitment to physical and mental well-being. Furthermore, Selena has taken the helm as a leader in her school, Health Occupational Student of America, demonstrating her commitment to a field that impacts the well-being of many. As the icing on the cake, she has been chosen to lead Andrew Hill High School, president for the 2023 to 2024 term, a testament to her peers' trust and her leadership ability. Selena Nguyen, journey and achievement thus far as an inspiration, not just to young girls, she mentor in the Gold Star Volleyball program, but to all of us. Her multifaceted approach to leadership, community involvement, and personal development serve as a shining example of what a young leader can accomplish when guy with passion, empathy, and relentless drive to make positive impact. In recognition of Selena Wynn's outstanding contribution and her unwavering commitment to, the be to better our community, I am proud to present a commendation to her. Selena, your achievement are a source of inspiration to us all, and your dedication serve as a beacon of hope for the future. May you continue to shine brightly in your endeavors, guiding others with your exceptional leadership and unwavering commitment to our community. Sure, thank you, and would you like to say a few words? If I knew Bien Don would say all of that, I would have mentally prepared a little bit more, but thank you, <laughs> council member. Um, good afternoon, esteemed council members and everyone present. My name is Selena Nguyen, and I'm a high school student, and I am a Girl Scout, and I'm working on my Gold Award. Um, I'm here to recognize and give my thanks first to uh, Mayor Mahan and council member Bien Don and his team. Uh, I would also like to thank Kim Ross and Avon Yung at the Community Center, um, and also every individual that helped me expand, gave insight, and also support my program. Without their help, without their support, I wouldn't have been here today. I'm here because the Gold Star Volleyball Program, which I established just this previous summer at my local community center, Seven Trees, allowed me to reach out to young girls with the passion of volleyball. Gold Star taught me not just how to coach my players and coach a team, but also how important it is to have this rec recreational program in order to establish this nurturing environment especially for the young generation. In my case, especially for the girls, I try to build this program to build a safe environment in a field where sports can be very male dominated. And in case of volleyball, it can be very expensive. Because Gold Star isn't just a volleyball club. It's a place where each girl recognizes they are a star. It's kind of corny, I know. <laughs> but it helps bring that energy back beyond the court and into their lives and back to the community. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you again, Bien Don, for this opportunity.
All right, we are on two orders of the day. Does anyone on the council have any changes to the printed agenda? Yes, Mayor, I'd like to uh, defer item 4.3 as uh, staff is gonna bring back to the Public Safety Committee back in uh, April 2024. Okay. And uh, assume we need a motion and a second on that. I think that was your motion. And all, yeah. And all, you're and moving all, and deferral 4.3? Yes, moving deferral 4.3 and we need a motion orders of the day. Second. That's good, and then I think we had a couple seconds there. Thank you, council member. Appreciate that. Uh, any other changes to the printed agenda? Okay. Do we have public comment on the orders of the day? No, we, we have no hands. Okay. You ready for me to start voting? Yes, sorry, I thought you said you had one hand. No, I said I had no hands. Oh, sorry. no hands, I yeah. apologize, let's vote. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously of those present. Great, thank you, Tony. Okay, we're on to the closed session report, Nora. Thank you, Mayor, we do not have a report out of closed session today. Great, thank you, Nora. On to the consent calendar. Are there any items the council would like to pull from the consent calendar? And I believe we have two. I don't know if there are others, but I'll just call out the two I'm aware of. Councilor Dwan would like to pull 2.8. Councilor Ortiz would like to pull item 210. Are there any other items? Okay. Let's take those in turn for comments and questions, and we'll see after the second item if we're able to make a motion on the entire consent calendar. Otherwise, if we need to, we'll do separate motions and separate votes. Councilor Dwan, on item 2.8, this is actions related to activate two overnight warming locations during the cold weather season. And I know you had comments. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council Member. Thank you for the, this time to discuss the activation of the overnight warming location at Tolly Library. I want our community to know that we've been taking steps to respond to the pressing needs of our residents, both housed and unhoused within our community. The Tolly Branch Library, located in District 7, is a site with historical rele relevance to the OWL program. Due to its frequency activation as a warming location, its proximity to nearby homeless encampments, once again has been chosen, chosen to be as an OWL site for current and cold weather season. It's a decision rooted in the commitment to support those in need of adverse weather condition. This initiative involved a collective effort from multiple entities, including San Jose Housing Department, PRNS, Library, Fire, Public Service, and San Jose Police Department, and Home First. While we are aware that Home First is the, is the first headline with some of the very concerned allegation, we must have faith in the process that the truth will come out over time, and we must address the needs of those who most need it right now. To help our most vulnerable, we must also ensure the safety and cleanliness of the immediate area are met for all of residents of San Jose. The Housing Department has assured us that additional measures have been taken to ensure the smooth functional of the program and have guaranteed the cleanliness and maintenance of the site to ensure seamless transition to regular programming during daytime hours and that families always feel safe. Home First has stated that two security guards would be optimal and are needed during the time, and it is my hope that the Housing Department find a way to fund one additional security guard to meet this important needs for this location during this, the OWL operation season. This program is a reflection of our commitment to the well-being of all of our community members, it stands as a beacon of hope and practical solution to address immediate needs during the challenge of cold weather condition. Thank you. 
Thank you, Council Member. Were, were you, I appreciate your comments. Did you want to direct a question to staff or was that sufficient? I'll, I'll move on unless you. Yeah, did. just go ahead and okay. um, allow uh, Council Member Torres to question. Okay, first. I think I had Council Member Ortiz next on this item, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to thank uh, staff from housing, wherever you guys are. Uh, thanks, staff from housing, uh, PRNS, library, and all departments that worked hard to put these locations together. Uh, as Councilmember Dewan had, has mentioned, it's of utmost importance that we act swiftly to provide this lifeline to our unhoused residents. That being said, the approval of another temporary contract with Home First comes at a time when there are serious allegations with regards to how staff are being treated. In, a, in addition to previous allegations of discriminatory firing, a San Jose Spotlight article this weekend reports on allegations from former Home First employees that, that stated that an HR manager complained that Home First hired too many Mexicans, quote unquote, and tallied employees by race as well as allegations of wage theft. Spotlight reports verifying these claims by reviewing the employee's email records. So I have a question for a representative from Home First, if uh, one is available. Thank you. Thank you. Council member. Given new concerns laid out about the culture and workplace environment, how are you responding to reestablish trust with the workforce and the community? Well, our staff are here today to represent themselves, and many of them would like to speak, so I'll leave that to them. Um, we actually hired an HR attorney to come in and review the records of the five employees in question, and she wrote a memo to our board saying that if she she found nothing wrong with the files, and that if she had to do it again, we should do it the exact same way. My mm -hmm. board felt very comfortable with that, number one. Uh, number two, we've activated our DEI council. We have a very active diversity, equity, and inclusion council. Um, and they review our policies and procedures. They reviewed our employee handbook. They reviewed our hiring policies and our onboarding policies so far. And we're gonna set them to reviewing our termination policies so that we can make sure we're completely equitable in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it sounds like uh, you're gonna have this DEI uh, committee review your firing practices. That's the one thing that you're gonna do to change? Absolutely. Okay. And we'll also work with LEAB to check out our shelters and get any feedback or recommendations we can from them. Okay, all right, thank you. I have a follow-up question for staff. If uh, a member from the housing department can be present. Thank you. During the October 24th, hey, how's it going? During the October 24th City Council meeting, the memo passed by Councilmember Torres directed staff to closely monitor Home First performance in all city contracts, including any issues with their staff and ensure contract performance metrics are met. I wanted to ask how the housing department plans to, to monitor these issues. Hi, Council Member Reagan Henninger with the Housing Department. We monitor all of our contracts uh, in the same way and the same procedures. The first area that we monitor is their financial spending, their progress on spending, but also what they're spending money on. So all of our contracts are reimbursement based so every month an entity submits an invoice for payment to the city along with all of their backup documentation timesheets receipts uh, we review their spending and their backup documentation to ensure 
that they're spending on track, not overspending or underspending, um, but also that they're spending on all um, allowable or eligible expenses. So we review their spending monthly. And then the second area that we monitor is on their outcome measures and their activities that are um, in their contract. So an example of an activity, I refer to it often as a widget. So it's things we can count. For example, a number of, the number of case management sessions. Those are the types of activities. Um, but all of our contracts also have outcome measures. So often those outcome measures are people connected to permanent housing or interim housing. Um, those are the things that are most important to the housing department. Mm -hmm. So we monitor and measure those activities and outcomes on a quarterly basis um, based on reports provided by our contractor, but we often go and verify the data in our homeless management and information system database. We'll do a re-verification of the data they submitted to us. So those are the two areas where, we're, where we have a contractual obligation to monitor the amount that they're spending, how they're spending it, and are they spending it correctly? And then are we, the city, getting what we paid for in terms of the activities and the outcomes um, that we're contractually obligated? And then one last thing that we do is we monitor um, what we consider high-risk contracts, and that can often be with entities that have a high dollar figure of money that they're receiving from the city. Um, we monitor those contracts a bit more closely um, with on-site desk monitoring of their files to make sure they have adequate backup documentation of all of the contracts um, that they have adequate time card records, for example. So we do that on-site as well. Um, but those are the primary ways that we um, monitor their performance. Okay, so it sounds like to me, correct me if I'm wrong, but the department's interpretation of Councilmember Torres's directive for staff to closely monitor home first performance is essentially to do what you've already been doing and to not change that pattern based on the amendment. Well, that's what we have a contractual obligation for, council member, is what's written in our contracts. I don't necessarily have the authority um, to intervene or monitor their personnel matters. Nobody's asking to do personnel matters. I never asked one second to mention personnel matters. So, okay, well, I gotta be, admit that I'm underwhelmed with both statements from the housing department and from Home First. I mean, personally, it seems like things are just gonna continue the way they are and essentially ignore it. And I appreciate staff being here, but I also saw the email from the executive director asking you to be here. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think this is like, oh, let's go out to the city council meeting. You all were asked to be here. But I, I, I think it's important that these questions are asked and, and that we're creating a sense of transparency for our community and advocates to understand that, you know, hopefully we are gonna be monitoring this situation. And, you know, personally, uh, I feel like a lot of our homeless service uh, 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 contracts need to go out for bid um, because we need to make sure that we're getting uh, the return on investment for our, uh, our taxpayer dollars. But I, I recognize the importance of having this um, this contract go through due to the short turnaround and that we are going to need to put these OWL locations up sooner rather than later. Um, so I look forward to the next competitive bid process. Thank Council you. Council Ortiz, if I could just also add, uh, Rosalind Huey, Deputy City Manager and Acting Housing Director. Um, we certainly understand the Council's concerns about the allegations, particularly regarding discrimination. And I just wanted to point out um, that the city has a standard uh, grant agreement which requires compliance with all laws, including discrimination. Uh, it's specifically section 14. So I just wanted to point that out. And obviously our remedy, if 
we find that something has been violated, obviously the city has the option to terminate the contract. So I just want to assure the mayor and the council that if anything should arise in the future, uh, that there is a, a way with which the city, the staff can, can address it. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Council member Torres. Good afternoon. Uh, and, and thank you for, for answering uh, Council Member Ortiz's um, question, questions. So uh, my questions, I think it's only and I know there's, there's some uh, serious allegations that we've been hearing and continue to hear, so it's very unfortunate. But when I met with you yesterday, Rosalyn and Reagan, my question was, does our city have the bandwidth to run these owls? And I know the answer, but we're in a public setting, so I think yeah. it's, it's important that I ask it in a public setting. Yeah. So, yeah, Thank you, Council Member Torres. Uh, and uh, we responded that no, uh, the city staff, city in fact does not have the bandwidth, our staff does not have the bandwidth to run these two owl locations this winter. Okay, and so, I'm, thank you for your, for your answer. I'm not, I'm not happy with the in, internal issues happening at home first. But as an elected official, I cannot in good conscience strike down a contract without a plan B. Uh, too much is, is at stake, and I will be grudgingly voting yes uh, on this contract. Overnight warming locations are critical to the survival of our unhoused community. As we saw last year, we had the coldest and the wettest winter. It ended in June, right? Uh, and so, you know, I'm gonna continue to look forward on having more conversation um, and hopefully that we can actually put some teeth to, to the memo that I submitted uh, regarding the concerns that we have with Home First. So, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Batra? Thank you, Mayor. In terms of this particular contract and this vendor, there are two items which we are responsible for or the housing is responsible for. One is their service which we contract with them, which means how they treat people who are coming to get the uh, overnight warming services. And second part is to your financial things which you describe how closely you monitor. I wanna know in terms of choosing a vendor, how was their performance last year when they ran our warming session places? When we competitively bid for a service council member, we do typically score um, based on an entity's past performance. There is a scoring item for that. Um, so it, that is factored in is how have they performed? Did they meet previous um, contract outcomes and objectives? So see, this is a very difficult staffing kind of an operation, you know. Uh, for serving the overnight warming session. Were they able to bring the staff as required? Or were they short of staff most of the time? Or do you know any of those numbers? Hiring for our overnight warming locations is traditionally very difficult. You're looking for a um, part-time seasonal worker and uh, someone who is willing and able to work an overnight shift. Um, so that's not an, it's not very easy um, to find individuals who want that type of work. So, so we had satisfactory services for the people who came to use the overnight stations, warming center, is that right? Home First has 
met their obligations, council member, if, that, if that's what your question is. And I will add that the, this particular type of work, it's an emergency response. Um, and we are putting home first in an imperfect situation. Um, and they perform quite well in very difficult circumstances. And what I mean by that is we're asking them to provide shelter in a physical environment that was not meant to be shelter, a library or community center. And there's often just logistical hurdles and difficulties with that alone. But then we're also asking them to do, run a shelter in ways that are not best practices. Another example is asking people to leave during the day. Um, that is not a national best practice in terms of providing shelter. So those are some examples of what I mean by we're asking Home First to perform in an imperfect environment. It's a very difficult service to offer. Not to mention on top of that, we ask that they provide very accessible low barrier shelter, meaning they'll take anyone whether or not that person is currently using a substance or has a behavioral health challenge or a physical disability, we ask them to take anyone and everyone. Thank you for that detailed explanation because what you're summarizing is that they are performing in a very, very difficult service and they've been able to deliver it in spite of that. So can I ask one question to the CEO from the uh, Yes, Council Member Bhatra. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, the question for you is, you have very serious allegations about wrongful termination, not treating your employee correctly. Even though we do not have direct rights to interfere with your work in terms of your employees, but as concerned council members, citizens, we do care about our fellow colleagues, whoever work, wherever they work. Could you tell me that with these serious allegations, there are government agencies like equal employment opportunities and those, and there are many pro bono organizations which pursue the cause of the employees who have been terminated, not properly, not treated properly. How many of those are trying to pursue anything about the terminated uh, candidates, if you can? None that I'm aware of. And let me state very clearly, council member, that we take the safety of the people we serve and our employees extremely seriously. We need them to do this critical work. We do the best we can to take care of them. And if we're doing something wrong, we want to know about it so we can fix it. Okay. All right. So, so far you don't have anybody asking you from the government agencies or private agencies representing these people. No, we don't. We just finished our Department of Labor audit two months ago, and it was clean on our equal opportunity um, issues. Um, we also were reaccredited by CARF and international accreditation for three years. They audited over a thousand items, and they found no problems. They accredited us right away. And we also were just recently audited by the city for our city outreach program, and okay. that came back clear as well. Okay, thank you very much. We will be watching for any action brought against you and that kind of thing because that would tell us we are not in a position to make a judgment, but I think these agencies are. So we will be monitoring that if any of those agencies come forward and what your reaction is because that would be our best way of knowing yes. how you're treating those people and how we should look at your uh, you. as a company. Okay. And we appreciate that, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilor Duan? Thank you, Mayor. I, I just have one question for staff. Um, what can we do to find that funding for extra security for residents that frequently visit the Tully Library and for the safety of our unhoused residents and for the staff that work at the library? Is there some way, somehow, we can find that funding? Or extra um, security guard, I'm sorry. Let me clarify that for you. Yeah, um, and I think the 
costs that we've sort of been looking at is an additional 75,000, somewhere in that area to add that additional security. And I believe we can do that, council member. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. We had a second item pulled. I don't see any other hands up on item 2.8. I do wanna see if we can take the consent calendar as a whole. We had item 2.10 pulled by council member Ortiz. This was actions related to the proposed fiscal year 23 through 25 spending plan for the supplemental law enforcement services grant and a revised spending plan. Council member Ortiz, would you like to comment or question? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just one quick question, uh, if there's staff available. All right, thank you so much. <sighs> Under the 2022-2024 revised spending plan, the memo mentions plans to purchase equipment replacements for the range unit uh, and technology devices for the covert response unit. Um, is there any way to provide specifics on what equipment is essentially being purchased? Yes, council member. This is Paul Joseph, assistant chief of police. So for the range, they're actually rifles to replace rifles we already had who've outlived their useful life. You know, like any piece of equipment, they, they have a life you know, yeah. expectancy yeah. and need to be replaced periodically. And then the other is a technology device to help locate wanted suspects. Okay, all right, thank you. That's it. Okay, thank you, council member. Thank you, assistant chief. I think we're good on that item. Uh, council member, did you wanna move the consent calendar as a whole by any chance? Sure, I now move the consent calendar as a whole. I would second. second. Great, okay, I saw a couple other hands. I assume those were all procedural, no questions. Okay, great. Uh, just before we go to public comment, um, and, then we'll, and then we'll vote, uh, Tony, how many cards do we have? I have 18 cards um, for in-person speakers and one hand up online. Okay, just want to do two things. First, while well, we have a number of members of the Home First team here, I, I just want to thank you all on the front lines, those of you who are working every day with our, one of our most vulnerable populations and just setting aside the question of the allegations through which I think we've determined there are some other uh, avenues through which to, to uh, adjudicate those if it you know, comes to that. I do just want to thank you while you're here. You are a, a, a partner of the city and I know many of you do very difficult work every day and I've had the privilege as have many of my colleagues of coming out and seeing you in action. We, uh, we appreciate the work you do every day. Um, as we move to public comment, uh, we have a very full agenda. I'd like to limit public comment on the consent calendar to one minute per speaker in the interest of time. And so, Tony, I'll turn it to you to have folks come down and share their perspective on Yep. any any of the items on the consent calendar today right so this is for consent calendar as a whole i have francis hearn elizabeth mac mac pan pan maggie crowder and mary anchetta if you can please make your way down and come down to the speaker you have one minute And Tony, other folks, so if your name was just yep. called, you can make your way down toward yes. the podium one at a time. Tony, should folks sit or line up in the aisle there? Oh, yeah, the security will, will tell people okay. what to do, but just come to first person to the microphone. You don't have to go in order. So again, I have Francis, Elizabeth, Maggie, and Mary, and then I'll call the other names as we go forward. Hello, Honorable Mayor and Council Member. Um, hi, I'm Frances Hernandez. I'm an Outreach Program Manager at, for Home First, and I've been with the agency for eight years this month. I'm here today to represent the incredible opportunity Home First has connected me to, serving our vulnerable neighbors who are unhoused. I did not start out as a program manager, but because Home First invests in people, I was able to grow, to have growth and training to now serve in this role. 
Outreach is such a valuable component in connecting unhoused participants to services. We see firsthand how individuals form a community at their encampment, especially the large ones, and some participants never leave the site. Which means if outreach does not visit, there may never, they may never receive the support or services needed. I have seen connections so impactful, such as a client who was blind, living outside an enclosed Thank you. Your time is up. Next speaker, I'd also like to call down Jay Stewart. Hi, good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and esteemed City Council. I'm Maggie Kreiber, the Director of our Street Based Services. I'm here because I want to be here. Um, I want to talk about last winter when floods and the floods that caused evacuations of creeks and waterways. My team worked endless hours, two weeks straight, and gave up their weekends to save people from the from the water. Um, two incidents that happened, like a man they found in the creek with rapidly rising waters, no pants, no shoes. The Home First team activated swiftly, recovering the man, warming him with dry clothes and transferring him to the evacuation center. Or the person they found wrapped in a tarp convulsing from the elements, they saved them as well. Even in the worst conditions, this outreach team is unstoppable. The passion keeps them going, whether cold, wet, or sweltering. They are forever mindful of the people we serve, and I ask you to be mindful of them and their heroic efforts for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. I'd also like to call Marcus. Hi, Mary. Um, I am part of the outreach team, so we go out every day and meet the clients. Um, I would say I'm proud to be part of Home First and um, that I'm proud to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Um, I'd also like to call down Kelly. Hello, my name is Elizabeth McApanpan. For the past four years, I have served my community as a senior director of facilities for Home First. I was born and raised in San Jose. I've built my career in the city. My work history expands over 45 years. For the past 14 years, I have worked for nonprofits. Throughout my career, I've always heard my employers talk about diversity, single digits. I now work for the first time in my career for an agency that truly practices DEI. During my first 90 days at Home First, it was stunning to see the staff diversity, people of color, ethnicities. Verna Myers, a DEI expert, says diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. There's no other way to describe Home First. They value each employee, their uniqueness, personalities, and more. Everything that makes us who we are. My managed teams include a brilliant black woman that serves as our property manager. My Thank you. Next speaker. Um, just, just sorry, I appreciate everyone's enthusiasm. Just in the interest of time, our, our um, custom is to just do jazz hands so Tony can be calling the next folks down just to be efficient. Thank you. Michelle, come on down as well. Michelle Diaz. Go ahead. All right. Good afternoon. Yes, my name is Justin Stewart. I'm with uh, the Permanent Supportive Housing Division and uh, Outreach Specialist. I'm actually from, I've only been here about a year, actually, here in San Jose. I'm from southeastern uh, United States, where uh, diversity is still something that is foreign. I can say coming to home first is probably one of the most um, remarkable experience I've had when it comes to diversity, inclusion, or equity when it comes to especially race. That's something that, as you can see, it's not going to be it's the first thing you're going to see, right? So it is, um, it's not there. It's not there. I've felt warm. I've felt warm. I've felt welcome since day one, and I will continue to, and I know they have their back, and we have theirs. Yeah. Thank you. Next speaker, also Andrea Urton. Good afternoon, esteemed members of City Council, and thank you for this opportunity to speak today. My name is Marcus Pereira. I'm one of the directors of Home First. I've been with the agency for nearly three years. As a dedicated member of the Home First team, I've been deeply inspired by the inclusive and diverse atmosphere that we've cultivated. Every day I'm greeted by a sense of unity and collaboration, a testament to the diverse backgrounds and perspectives that make our team unique. At our core, we're an organization enriched by diversity, mirroring the vibrant tapestry of our community. Our team's rich blend of cultural backgrounds and life experiences position us well to effectively address the diverse needs of those we assist. 
Diversity to Home First is not just a value, it's a vital part of how we operate. It empowers us to forge meaningful connections and provide targeted support, fostering an atmosphere of inclusivity and understanding. I appreciate your time today in considering the significant role diversity plays in enhancing the work we do at Home First and its impact on our community. Thank you. Next speaker, um, Eddie Viarro. Thank you, Honorable Mayor Mahan and City Council members. My name is Andrea Erton, and I'm the CEO for Home First. Thank you for the opportunity to meet with most of you over the last couple of weeks. After an internal investigation, we have determined that the allegations based on are based on inaccurate and incomplete information provided to the NAACP by terminated employees. Home First cannot comment on specific employee matters due to privacy laws. However, we invite the terminated employees to waive their privacy rights and make their employee record public. Once public, we are confident that the employee files will demonstrate the justified reasons for the terminations and the rigor following and during the process. And I did send the email to ask people to come because I was being stopped in the hallway constantly by staff asking if they could come and speak. So I wanted to make that available to them. Using their voice is critical, and I want to teach them that it's okay to do that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Your time is up. Um, next speaker, I'm also calling Renee Ramirez. Can you hear me? Okay. Honorable Mayor and Council Members, my name is Kelly Vasquez and I'm Home First Chief Program Officer. I'll take you a little bit through history. We coined the term OWL back in our proposal to begin operating in 2016 and it was a challenging program. Uh, other providers shied away from it, uh, but Home First did not because we understood then as we understand now that OWLs save lives and there is nothing ultimately that's more important to that. So whether it be inclement weather, floods, fire, when the city needs a partner who will face the challenge and step up to the plate, Home First has been there and we will be there on behalf of our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, um, Jessica, also come on down. Uh, Mayor and City Council, thank you for letting us be here. My name is Eddie Villarreal, and I am a resident of San Jose. I have been an outreach specialist for one year through Home First, and I enjoy every moment of it. The reason being is that we help the homeless to identify specific resources and services that help them to find solutions on their own, that helps them to succeed so that way it leads them on a path to growth. Some outreach efforts take shape as programs that tend to create opportunities and prevent programs. If you see an immediate or long-term need, outreach can and is and can be used, excuse me, to cultivate healthy habits, skills, and interests in your target population. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, also Jason Ramos, come on down. Good afternoon, honorable mayor and esteemed council members. My name is Michelle Diaz. I currently work as a program manager within the outreach department at Home First. I've been in homeless services for over 10 years and I consider myself honored to be part of the Home First team. I am from a smaller county where the decisions that are made sometimes stem from traditional thinking. However, when I came to work in San Jose several years ago, I was impressed by the cohesiveness and collaborative efforts of many organizations like Home First. I quickly noticed that people here were driven to collectively tackle serious issues such as homelessness. Government, nonprofit, and partner agencies were focused on addressing critical needs. They had resources, they were visionaries, and they possessed a strong ability to manage effective par partnerships with one another equitably and fairly. Currently, San Jose is facing one of the worst homeless crises in the city's history, and it is vital that we all work together harmoniously to combat this complex social issue. I am confident that effective partnerships are not a thing of the past. I know in my heart that we're all here to thank you next speaker and Gary come on down good afternoon honorable mayor members of the city council my name is Renee Ramirez I'm chief operating officer at home first 
been with the agency for eight years. I love this agency. I love the work that we do, and I love the people that are doing this uh, very difficult work. We've been criticized quite a bit recently, and I ask you to hold judgment based on rumor and one-sided reporting, and seek out facts to investigate all sides of the conversation. The idea of telling Mexican people in our HR department when a Mexican man is overseeing the HR department is utterly ridiculous. We welcome the call for accountability. We welcome uh, the oversights. We're happy to continue these conversations. I also invite you to get, to, this, to get us to know better, visit our sites, visit our service providers, our, our operations people, right with our outreach teams, uh, and get to know our culture firsthand. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, um, Jasmine, come on down too. Honorable Mayor and City Council members, my name is Jessica Menchaca, current resident of District 2. I am current, I've had the privilege of being home, at home first and working for them for four years, and I say privilege with heart, where I'm currently the talent development director. To put it simply, I help staff understand their role in ending homelessness and equip them with the tools to do so. During staff trainings, I often ask them why they chose to work at home first and why they choose to stay. One staff said, I want people experiencing homelessness to know that someone cares. Another staff said, I'm happy to be part of an organization that celebrates the diversity and various backgrounds of staff of those we serve. As someone who was homeless in San Jose, I love that I get to show them that this is possible to overcome homelessness, end quote. And as a previous community engagement coordinator for the Bridge Housing Communities and emergency interim housing sites both in San Jose, I had the pleasure of interviewing people who moved into permanent housing, many who attributed their success to Home First staff. Thank you, your time. Um, Cameron, come on down, and also next speaker. Hello, Honorable Mayor and esteemed council members of San Jose. My name is Jason Ramos, and I'm a proud native of San Jose, having grown up in District 1. I'm an employee of Home First, as well as the chair of the DEI Council. I thank you for this opportunity to speak, and I hope you've also had the chance to review the letter of support submitted on the DI Council. My experience with Home First has been absolutely unparalleled compared to any other employer I've worked for. Since my first day three and a half years ago, I was able to do something I haven't been able to do before, and that was to be myself. As a proud Filipino American of the LGBTQ community, I have never felt so seen as an individual, and I thank the safe space Home First has offered me. I even connected Home First to the, their first Pride event at Silicon Valley Pride in 2021. I hope hearing the sentiments here today would implore you to have a more balanced outlook on Home First, the work we do, and the nourishing environment we have for our staff. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Um... I think this is B. Ramos. I'm not sure. So if that sounds like it could be your name, please come on down. Go ahead. Honorable Mayor, Council Members, uh, I want to thank you for giving us the time to, you know, give us the time to voice our, I don't know if I want to say frustrations, but it's an honor and privilege working for Home First. Um, uh, being from San Jose, you see all these homeless people, unfortunately, that are in the house, and you know, opening up this L, uh, L program will give them opportunity, even if just for a night to, uh, for one night to have a warm bed, a uh, warm meal, you know, shower, whatever it may be. And it's, a, it's an honor and privilege, like I said, to work at home first. I know that I could go to any, I could go to our CEO and ask them if I have a question on, you know, anything I'm working on, and they're, they're there to help us. Thank you, for, thank you for the time. Thank you. Next speaker, um, Kelly, also come on down. Mayor and city council members, thank you for allowing me to be here. My name is Cameron Finney, and I'm here because I want to be. I have been a resident of District 3 for the past eight years and have been a part of Home First for two and a half years. I started as a security guard, but I saw the great work being done and wanted to be a part of it. I currently work in street-based outreach services, and I just wanted to express how proud I am of all the hard work our organization has done and continues to do. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, also Yule and Sean, come on down. 
Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and esteemed members of the City Council. My name is B. Ramos, and I'm the Vice President of Emergency Housing at Home First. I've been a part of the Home First team for seven years. I am also a native of San Jose, born and raised on the east side of San Jose. I currently reside in District 2 and have had the privilege of welcoming a Sergio Jimenez council member to our Ride Alongs with Outreach and also overnight at one of our overnight warming locations. I have dedicated two decades of service at various nonprofits focused on serving the marginalized communities, particularly communities of color. I stand before you today, represent Home First, a committed organization to DEI and addressing the critical issues of homelessness. For those unfamiliar with OWL, OWL stands for Overnight Warming Location. OWL is a saving initiative that involves multiple partner agencies working collaboratively to raise awareness, facilitate referrals, and enroll individuals in services. The dedicated team from Home First, the City of San Jose Housing Response Team, PRNS, VHHP, Home First Out. Thank you. Next speaker. Dear Honorable Mayor and esteemed council members, my name is Kelly Cape and I'm the Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at Home First. Cutting the funding to Home First, the largest provider of critical housing aid in Santa Clara County is guaranteed to cost lives. Because of the systemic barriers in place in our society, these deaths when people are left without support are historically disproportionately people of color Redlining, systemic disinvestment, wage disparities, discriminatory lending, inaccessible credit, gentrification, zoning policies, and mass incarceration, and more, are all historical yet active obstacles designed to keep people of color out of homes. At Home First, in streamlining shelter services and direct aid to navigating permanent housing, we are actively dismantling these oppressive systems of discrimination. Maintaining low barrier shelters and facilitating permanent housing is one of the most anti-racist pursuits available in this society. Thank you. Your time is up. Next speaker. Thank you. Hello. How's everybody doing? My name is Jules Sterner. I'm with Hunger at Home, CEO and founder. I've been fortunate enough to partner with Home First for the last 10 years and fortunate enough to visit the owl shelters, the different um, shelters on Little Orchard, and really join Beatrice on the outreach program and see those that are unhoused and the benefit that Home First provides. In fact, their leadership is one of my mentors, someone that I look up to, and Andrea is just one of the best, and I can't speak highly enough. So I'm here just to say what an advocate I am, and they do so much good work. The community needs them. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. So this is 2.8, correct? Yes. Okay. So I'll talk about the owls. Um, I am grateful to see that the owls are where two of the largest camps are, Roosevelt and Tully. So thank you very, very much. It's been long overdue for them to be back at Tully. Um, much appreciated. And that's where people can really access these owls. Um, should there be more owls? Heck yeah. There should be four. There should be six. They should definitely be near your area. The south side really needs an owl again. Uh, Sergio, you had one in your area, and that was popular. Uh, we should definitely, the south needs it. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't address that fantastic publicity stunt behind me. And I'm curious how much did that come out of the shelter management budget? Did that come out of an outreach budget? I'm just curious. And since the issue is the firing of black people at Sunnyvale, Sunnyvale wasn't invited to this publicity stunt. Neither was Gilroy. And the majority of those people aren't black. Let's address the real Thank you. Um, online, I have Serge followed by Marie. of the overnight warming locations. In order to truly address homelessness, we need all the tools in our toolbox. Outreach, shelter, interim housing, and more affordable housing need to be made available to thousands of people who are experiencing homelessness. These services are essential and life-saving. The teams I supervise interact each day with people who are ready to embrace services. 
only to find out there's no suitable option for their needs. And these needs will continue to grow as the housing crisis deepens and as extreme weather patterns continue to be the norm. We have seen unusual hot weather, heavy rains, floods, and intense cold. While these can be inconvenient for housed individuals, for our unhoused neighbors, they can be deadly. Thank you for supporting a range of solutions, including the one to- Marie, followed by Brian. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor Mahan, esteemed city council members and staff. My name is Marie Jackson, and I am the Marketing and Public Affairs Officer at Life Moves. As a longstanding member of San Jose's nonprofit community, Life Moves wrote a letter of support for Home First, which you have in your packet. Being one of the region's providers and interim housing and support services, Life Moves is grateful to work alongside Home First on the front lines of San Jose's fight to provide housing, support, and care for our unhoused neighbors. We consider Home First a key partner and a critical part of San Jose's supportive housing ecosystem. Our interim housing eco ecosystem relies on collaboration and partnership across all agencies with the city and county working together to end homelessness. Knowing their leadership team, we are certain that they will answer your questions and embrace your feedback. Thank you for your time and consideration. Brian. Thank you very much. I give a uh, blessing to all of you. And the Home First does try to do it really good. Just a suggestion to the employees, please speak with legal counsel before you give up any of your uh, uh, employee rights uh, to privacy. Please seek uh, avid counsel from people who are professional in the area. Thank you. Back to counsel. Thank you, Tony. Once again, thank you to everyone who attended today and spoke. Uh, appreciate the work you all do. I know it's very difficult, but important work. We're ready to vote, Tony. Motion passes unanimously of those present. Um, okay. I, I just want to note for the record, for those people who can't see, um, Dev Davis is absent for the entire meeting and everybody else is present. Great. Okay, consent calendar passes unanimously. We are on to land use. Item 8.1, we have approval. Thank you. We have approval of an exception to the city multifamily housing revenue bond policy allowing Madera on the Alameda to use an alternate bond issuer. We do have a short staff presentation. We'll wait on staff to come down to the box. Go ahead. Good, good afternoon, everyone. We are here today to request approval of certain recommendations relating to the Madera, Madera the Alameda housing development. My name is Kemet Mawakana, Division Manager of the Residential Development Division for the City of San Jose Housing Department. I'm joined here today by my colleagues, Banu Sun and Chin Yu Sun. The Madera is located at 787 the Alameda in San Jose. It consists of 168 units with commercial space on the ground level. There are 64 units for families. The developer and city agreed to a 75 year affordability restriction. This, this is important because it advances one of the housing department's key goals of maintaining long term affordability. It also helps protect tenants from the development possibly returning to market rate rents. This is a unique deal, different from our normal affordable housing deal in important ways. For example, in our typical affordable housing deal, there would be guidelines and protections from SIDLAC at play. 
and there would be additional underwriting by a commercial lender. Here, there, there is no CITLAC and, then, and there is no commercial lender, only the minimal requirements of the 501c3 bonds. The developer and city agreed to the city being named an administrator in the regulatory agreement. This will advance another of the city's important goals, ensuring the upkeep of the property over the long run. It also will help to ensure that problems are minimized or avoided at the property. So the Madeira project does not have any subordinate funding from the city. In order to finance the project, the developer of the project will request the California Municipal Finance Authority to issue up to $100 million in unrated tax exempt 501c3 bonds through public offering. This prompts staff to request council approve exception to the multifamily housing revenue bond policy. Our po bond policy requires credit enhancement and a minimum A rating for all public issuance. As, the, as requested by the, um, by the developer, the city would not be able to issue such bond on the public market. Additionally, the city also does not have sufficient capacity and staffing to prepare and, and manage the bond issuers for this, for this project. So in order to facilitate the bond issuance, and the city needs to uh, approve the bond issuance by CMFA and hold TEFR hearing in accordance with the tax code. With that, we finish our uh, presentation and request the council approval for the exception of the multi uh, exception to the multifamily housing revenue bond policy, and now we are open for questions. Great, thank you. Do we have public comment? Catalyze SB. Are we at two minutes or one? Yeah, let's go back to do two minutes for now. This is Alex Shore speaking personally, not on behalf of any organization or commission or community group. Just wanted to ask staff if they'd be willing to share a little bit more of the story of how this came about. It's exciting news to have more affordable housing in our community and having middle class folks be able to live on the Alameda. Uh, speaking as a neighbor, this is a bit of a surprise. We haven't heard much about this. And so even though it's not a new development, it's always good to have the community engaged in these processes. And uh, I think the memo left a little bit of a question mark on how this came about and how the city is keeping an eye out for these opportunities, how it hears about these opportunities and how it matches with nonprofits like this one to purchase the land. I think one of the great things about this conversion is that residents will get top-notch amenities. There's a pool at this building, a rooftop deck, and that's exactly the kind of equity we wanna see where residents of San Jose who live in affordable housing get great places. One of the great places they're also getting in this building is the ground floor, which is a, a core power yoga, a local pub, and a hardware store. And I wonder if council members or city staff would be willing to ask or talk about that dynamic because we do want to see that ground floor activation continue. And I'm wondering if there's anything that city staff can shed light on and how that will be managed to ensure that this continues to add vibrancy to the neighborhood and amenities for the affordable housing residents nearby. So kudos to staff for their creativity in finding places where we can get affordable housing in buildings that already exist. And if you could tell us the community more of the story of this, how this came about, that would be appreciated. Brian, followed by Ryan. Thank you. Yeah, I echo what the gentleman just said. Uh, really. Well, not Brian, but yeah, you know, Brian. Yes, you guys doing it. Uh, you guys, I'm sorry, that's your shit. Uh, the individuals who worked on this are um, should be recognized. You know, this is hard work, and you're having to work between many different bureaucracies and between state laws, local laws. You know, and finding new ways to form multifamily housing revenue, especially for people with uh, issues with income, is critical. And I think everybody agrees with that and the more long-term sustainable type of housing um, would be really good. And I, I didn't think I'd say this, but 
I'm actually thinking it moved back over to by the Alameda. It, the area really has changed a lot, and that's because of the the pressure, the the effort San Jose and Santa Clara put forward for that. Thank you, Ryan. Hi, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I was curious, and looking at the presentation and noting some of the rents that are proposed for the AMI units, they look to be very similar to what the current rents are at the property. So if you could just shed a little light on why this is a public benefit and why we'd be foregoing significant tax revenue to support a project that isn't actually supporting affordable housing. Thank you. Back to council. All right, thank you. We will start with Councilor Batra. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I just want to get a clarification uh, in terms of the what's stated here. Are you just using a different person, different organization to issue the bond, or you're changing the how the financing is happening? Because I, what I read there shows that allow the approval for alternate organizations. So help me understand, are we just using a different organization? Are we actually changing the financing model here? Um, we are asking the city council approval, the issuance from a, a different organization. In, in the past, the city, <clears throat> most of the time, the city issues bonds are, are, um, at ourselves. But this one, this bond will be issued by the California Municipal Financing Authority. So it is a different kind of organization than bonds. Uh, in terms of a bond issuance, it's really depend, it's between, um, the detail of the bond issuance will be between the, the CMFA and the developer. So, so sorry, sorry, sorry can, I didn't can, understand whether it is, still the change in organization yes. you're using or it is, is it a, a change in financing model? It is a changing of an organization. It's a, it, the, the bonds will be issued by CMFA, not the city. So it is a changing of organization. The uh, financing model, uh, I can't really comment on that. It's a def definitely the issuance model is different from the city's issuance. Okay. Thank so you very Council much. Member Batra, yeah. Rosalind Hugh, if I could just add, and I think Van Nusan is also going to add to just provide some clarity. So just wanted to make sure the council understood that this developer, it's actually Catalyst Housing Group approached the city with the request for this bond deception. So it, it is different than what we would normally do. So I just wanted to provide that clarity that this is at the request um, of the developer um, indicating that they would like CMFA to actually issue the bonds. And Banu, did you have anything else to add? If I may, yes. I wanted to just explain that the city is mainly the issuer, and the issuer for these uh, private placement, you know, multifamily residential uh, notes. There are scenarios where there are outside organizations that issue these bonds, and the city has a joint powers agreement with these organizations. CMFA is one of these organizations. So if we're not the direct issuer, we will see cases um, where CMFA may be the issuer, and then they will come to the city for approval and an exemption to, the, to our bond policy, which is exactly what this is today. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Councilmember, did you wanna move the staff recommendation? Uh, I move the recommendation to approve. Uh. Second. Okay. Let's see the other hands. Let's vote. Motion passes unanimously. All right. Thank you. Okay, we are on to item 3.1. Thank you all. Report of the city manager. Thank Thanks you, Mayor. Report. I do have a report today. As we are all very aware, our San Jose is one of the most diverse large cities in the country and our arts and cultural sector is a big part of what makes this city so unique. 
Recently uh, published data reports revealed how much this sector supports our economy and has contributed to the recovery and vibrancy of our downtown, supporting our attracting investments in jobs and housing city council focus area. The Arts and Economic Prosperity Six, six report shares that San Jose's nonprofit arts and culture sector generated 292 million in economic activity in the calendar year 2022, nearly 100 million in spending by nonprofit arts and cultural organizations, and 192 million in event related expenditures by their audiences. The report reconfirms that nonprofit arts and culture organizations are businesses. They employ people and keep printers, graphic designers, accountants, babysitters, and of course, bellhops and waiters busy. This economic activity supported 4,738 jobs in San Jose and generated 46.4 million in tax revenue. San Jose's arts and culture also play a cr crucial role in the recovery and resurgence of our downtown. City staff estimates by the end of calendar year 2023, our permitted outdoor events such as San Jose Jazz Summerfest, Viva Calle SJ, and Christmas in the Park will attract a total of 1.98 million people to downtown, representing 97% of our pre-pandemic attendance numbers. Our partners have seen an increase in attendance with Team San Jose reporting the Center for the Performing Arts, Civic Auditorium, California Theater, and the Montgomery Theater are at 102% of pre-pandemic levels. Overall, downtown activity is trending up. According to the, the, a new University of Toronto study based on mobile phone data, the number of unique visitors in downtown during the months of March through June 2023 reached 96% of 2019 levels, ranked third nationwide, and is the best performing city in California. Our arts and cultural events have contributed to this trend. I want to thank our art partners, Team San Jose, and our Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs for their passion and commitment to our city. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate you sharing the good news. We're certainly seeing a rebound in downtown, which is, which is a wonderful thing. I know Councilor Torres agrees. Uh, still a long way to go, but, uh, but it's very positive. Okay, we're on to item 3.3, authorizing the Departments of Finance and Energy to evaluate the feasibility of energy prepayment transactions, and we do have a staff presentation. Feel free to jump in when you're ready. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Lori Mitchell, Director of Energy, and I'm very pleased today to be joined by Zach Strike, our Assistant Director of Energy, Rick Bruno, our Director of Finance, and Luz Caprepi Howe, our Assistant Director of Finance. So just as a quick reminder of the services that San Jose Clean Energy provides, we source clean energy, so, you, so that is us um, at the start of this graphic. That energy is typically solar, wind, hydro, um, it's delivered on the California transmission grid, which is operated by the California Independent System Operator. And then PG&E delivers that energy over their lines and is responsible for distribution. Just a quick overview of our products and our rates. So right now, as a reminder, um, most of our customers are saving 1% to 3% on their electric generation rate. And you can see that on this table, as well as the other products that we offer in comparison to PG&E. Um, important to note that we offer a 10% discount to our low-income residents through our SJ Cares program. So now that we're entering almost our fifth year of operations, we have procured about $4.19 billion in renewable energy power products. Um, and that includes about $2.4 billion in long-term power supply agreements. So these are agreements with solar, wind, um, that span through 2045. Over the past year, we have been exploring a, a mechanism to reduce our power supply costs to further save costs for our customers, and this involves prepaying a portion of those long-term power purchase agreements. This is a pretty well-established um, 
transaction in the industry. This really started in the 1990s with natural gas plants, and now it's being used for a lot of renewable energy supplies. So you can see here other CCAs just over the past couple of years that have used this financing mechanism to issue bonds to prepay a portion of their power supply agreements. Um, so far, they successfully have issued $7.6 billion, and collectively that saved their organizations about $45 million. So we have been definitely interested in this and, and are recommending continuing to explore that for San Jose. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Luce to explain uh, the details of the financing mechanism. So I'm going to walk you through the financing, uh, um, the current uh, way that the clean energy does its, its purchase power purchase agreements, and then explain how the new, we would do it under a prepay financing transaction scenario. So uh, just to talk about the participants in the, in the usual power purchase agreement deal, of course, it's clean energy, the finance department, and then it's an energy counterparty. So the other party to an agreement with the city for the purchase or sale of power products. And so this is a graphic that represents what that deal looks like, that transaction looks like. So it's clean energy on one side, an energy counterparty, or a power generator on the other side of the transaction. Number one is a power purchase agreement, and that is simply, once again, an agreement for clean energy to procure power products from the power generators. Very, very straightforward. On a monthly basis, number two, energy comes from the energy counterparty to clean energy, and once again, on a monthly basis, clean energy pays the power generators, the energy counterparty. So what does a prepay f uh, financing transaction look like versus this one? So we have a number of participants. We still have, obviously, clean energy in the finance department. We still have our energy counterparty. But we start adding additional participants to this. We add the conduit issuer, which is an arm's length tax exempt ish bond issuer to the deal. We add a prepay counterparty, which is a financial institution or other investment grade credit rated entity. We add a tax exempt bondholders. They are purchasers of those prepay bonds in exchange for principal and interest payments, which is debt service over the term of the respective bond. And then we add the transaction consultants, which support the, the structuring and the issuance of the prepay bonds. These are folks like the bond and tax council and municipal financial advisors and others. So once again, to use a graphic to explain this, it's a little bit more complicated as you might see. So once again, we have clean energy. We have uh, on the left-hand side, we have the energy counterparty. On the right-hand side, that's the power generators. We have number one, the power purchase agreements are still in place. But the difference about these power purchase agreements is there is language in there that includes the ability to assign on a limited basis uh, to a prepay counterparty using the term, the, the, um, the, uh, a limited agreement, a limited assignment agreement, then that's number two. And that's in the middle towards the top. So that's one agreement. The next agreement is between clean energy and the conduit issuer, and that's the lower left-hand side of the, fr of the um, slide, and that is a clean energy purchase contract, and essentially it's the terms and conditions between clean energy and the conduit issuer. At this point, we're looking at California Community Choice Financing Authority. That is a joint powers authority that is made up of, a big, I believe, five community choice aggregators, similar CCAs that are similar to clean energy. So it, it's, a, it's a familial connection in that, in that they basically are in the same business that we are. So the, the next agreement that happens is number four between the prepay counterparty. That's a financial institution. That's generally the, Morgan, the, the very large organizations, J.P. Morgan, uh, Citigroup, World Bank of Canada, so these, these are robust institutions. They are investment grade. They are highly rated they're in this business. And that's a master power supply agreement that is entered into between the prepay counterparty, again, the financial institution, and the conduit issuer that essentially, once again, lays out the terms and conditions. Number five is when the conduit issuer issues the debt, the tax exempt bond to the bondholders, this, it is important to note that these bonds are non-recourse to the city or clean energy. 
And what that means is that those bonds do not appear on the city balance sheet. They do not appear in clean energy's balance sheet. They are not debt of the city or clean energy. So in the future, as we go out for a credit rating for clean energy or when we're examining our debt, our debt portfolio, these, these bonds will not appear. Number six is those dollars that come from those bond, the issuance of those bonds, those dollars are given to the, are forwarded to the financial institution. And, sorry. And then seven, and so finally the, the transaction has happened, the funds have been transferred to the financial institution, and now here comes the energy. So on the right hand side again, at number seven, the energy counterparty is providing the energy to the prepay counterparty. The prepay counterparty uh, pays the energy counterparty. These transactions are happening on a monthly basis. Number nine, the prepay counterparty moves that energy to through the conduit issuer. The conduit issued at number 10 moves that to clean energy. And please think, no, these are virtual transactions. We're not actually, these are move, the energy is moving through the grid. These are just payments that are being transferred back and forth. But we're demonstrating that it is paying for energy between these separate, separate entities. And number 11, which is the red arrow from clean energy to the conduit issuer. And this is where the importance of the discount is. So in the memo, we referred to a uh, minimum 8% discount that we were looking for, for uh, that we would consider a successful transaction and a transaction we would entertain if we were able to go forward on this. And so effectively, if I want to give you a simple example, if I have a power purchase agreement that's for $100, that, that payment for number 11 would be, and, and assuming an 8% minimum, essentially clean energy would be paying $92 versus the $100. So that's where the discount happens. And then finally, the last red arrow is uh, the payment from the conduit issuer, once again, non-recourse to the city. As you can see on the graphic, there is no connection between clean energy and the taxes and bondholders. That debt pay, service is paid by the conduit issuer. So what are some considerations regarding these financing transactions? The savings that we're talking about, these 8% savings, are really only available during the initial pricing period, or the, what's called the tenor. And that's for the first five to 10 years. Now, we will eventually during this 30, the bonds are for 30 years, but we have them cut up into pieces in, in particular tenors. So the, there is potential in the future that we may not have an ability to market these same, these same purchase power agreements again. It's important to note that while we will realize savings during the first five to 10 years, we may not realize any additional savings. Once again, that's dependent on what the market, what the market will bear. So in summary, the economics over the 30-year life of the bonds are, are fairly unknown, but for the first five to 10 years, again, the initial tenor, we will realize those savings. It is a complex and is a lengthy transaction structure. While it has been in place since the 1990s across the United States, mostly in gas. Uh, right now, in the last few years, it's been, it's been used for uh, electrical energy as well. And as we demonstrated on, on the chart before, uh, community, the particular CCCFA, or the JPA, that we've been talking about issued that $7.7 .7 billion worth of bonds. And then also there will be multiple remarketing door, remarketings during the life of the bonds. And I'll turn it over to Rick Bruno to finish. Thank you, Luz. Next, I will cover the benefits, risks, mitigations, and next steps as it pertains to the prepayment transaction. Overall, this financing mechanism provides the potential for San Jose Clean Energy to realize 7 to 10% savings or $4 to $6 million per year over the existing power purchase agreements pricing. The city is targeting an 8% savings threshold during the initial pricing period, which is typically 5 to 10 years. Another benefit of proceeding with the prepayment financing transaction is the bonds are non-recourse to the city or San Jose Clean Energy. As a result, the bonds will not be on the balance sheet, meaning that the debt will not be adversely affect any financial ratios used by rating agencies in the future, including the uh, debt capacity or the debt coverage ratio. Uh, finally, the savings noted above can help San Jose Clean Energy stay competitive with rates, build fund reserves, fund customer programs and or energy related climate smart work.
On the risk side, there are four risks identified related to energy prepayment transactions, along with the mitigations. Financial risk is minimized by utilizing the conduit issuer. As previously noted, the bonds are non-recourse to the city, so there is little to no financial risk. Prepay counterparty risk is minimized by selecting an experienced counterparty through a competitive procurement process and by requiring a termination payment sufficient to pay all bonds should a default event occur. Volumetric risk is minimized by assigning only a portion of eligible power purchase agreements, structuring the transaction to allow substitution and addition of other power purchase agreements and including a provision to remove or replace underperforming energy counterparties. And finally, regulatory risk will be monitored for any IRS changes that impact the treatment of these transactions. So looking at next steps, at this point in our assessment, we feel that there are adequate risk mitigation strategies in place and the benefits outweigh the risk. Today's action is to gain City Council's authorization to continue evaluating the feasibility of energy prepayment financing and authorization to join the California Community Choice Financing Authority if deemed feasible. Between December and May, the city will issue a request for proposal for prepay counterparties, amend power purchase agreements to include assignment language, finalize the portfolio of power purchase agreements that will be included in the transaction, and join the California Community Choice Financing Authority should the transaction's projected savings reach 8%. In June 2024, we will return to City Council to present the results of the feasibility evaluation and, if recommended, present required agreements and documents to the City Council for approval. So the final slide includes the recommendation for reference. This concludes our presentation and we're available for questions. Great. Thank you for taking the time to walk us through that. Tony, do we have public comment? Um, we have no cards or hands up for this item. Okay. Great, coming back to the council then. And maybe I'll kick off with just a quick question. Is, is the primary reason this would work, the difference, essentially the difference, but just trying to simplify what was a, a lot of dense material, the difference between the cost at which we can essentially borrow money as a, as a public entity versus the cost of capital for the counterparty out there? I mean, that's essentially where the arbitrage, not in, a, not in a bad sense, but that's, okay, not the right word, but what, that's where the gap is, essentially. Yeah, that's exactly where it exists. So, a, once again, a real simple example, I'm making up numbers again. Um, if we, if the cost of capital for that financial institution is um, five, five, $5 on $100, so that's 5%. So you've got a $100 loan they need to get, a $100 bond you need to do, they pay $5. As a tax exempt, we might issue it at, at Four, it might cost us four dollars. Yeah. It might cost us four percent. So that difference is the benefit. Right. Okay. That's what I thought. Just wanted to make sure that was correct and made sense to everyone. Okay. Great. Councilor Dewan. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I have several questions here. Thank you, staff, for the report. After the five or ten years of getting reduced cost, what happened after that? the next 20 years or so? So um, as, as Rick and Luz, that's a great question, council member. Um, as they explained, um, we could remarket it. If um, the market isn't there and that isn't successful, then what happens is it reverts to the agreement that we have today. So uh, the status quo, um, we continue paying the price um, that we have agreed to as it stands today. Thank, Thank you. you. T Tony, can you show the graphic that do you have online? I can't, but they can. Oh. They're pulling it up. In that case. Which graphic? Uh, that was sent over from my Slide office. Slide 18? Eight. No, no, it was a it was a graphic sent over by my chief of staff. Not from the presentation. No. Um, oh, I just got it in my email. 
Hold on. Okay, so here's a simple, my, my staff spent hours just uh, creating this graphic and showing their artistic value here. So if you look to the right, obviously the District 7 um, residents, um, they, when they get their bill, they're, they're not very happy. The actual cost is less, and the saving is above. Where does that saving goes to? Does it go back to the residents where it should be? Uh, because people pay for what they get and not a penny more, and, and I wonder where is that saving $46 million per year go to? Yeah, that, that's a very good question, council members. So our rates are set based on our power supply costs. So if we can lower those costs, we can pass along rate savings to customers. Um, so typically we bring forward a rate recommendation annually. This year we'll bring that forward in January. Um, and so this will inform those rate recommendations. So there's, um, you know, number one, our power supply costs inform our rates and that's, that's our biggest cost. So that's why we're looking at you know, every possibility of how to reduce those costs. The other things that we consider is building fund reserves, so making sure we can keep our rights competitive over the long term. And then also um, this year we'll look at, at small amounts of program funding for our customers as well, and that all will come to council for approval. Um, so looking forward to that conversation in January, but it's a really good point. Thank you. Is part of that saving could go to general fund? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So unfortunately, we cannot, our, the regulations, um, you know, require us to use energy funds um, on uh, the services that we provide. So we can um, fund energy programs and related services, and we can provide rate discounts, discounts to low-income <coughs> customers, but not directly to the general fund. Thank you. Well, I would imagine that the resident would be very appreciative if they get some type of refund or credit towards their uh, the bill. Thank you very much for your uh, report. Thank you, Councilmember. Would you like to move the staff rec? Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to move to ex uh, accept the uh, staff report. Second. Okay. <coughs> Tony, let's vote. Motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you all. All right, we are on item 3.4, which is the acceptance of retirement plans, comprehensive annual investment fee reports for calendar year 2022. We do have a staff presentation. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, City Council members, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is the report everyone's waiting for. It's the annual expense report of our pension plans, and uh, it's my privilege to present this to the council, as I have done for the last five years. And uh, just to preface my remarks, this is one of the most comprehensive uh, reports presented by any public institution uh, in the state of California. So we have very, very few peer data points uh, to compare to, and the credit for that should really go to my predecessor who came up with this uh, report several years ago. Uh, with that, I'm going to... And also to introduce, sorry, uh, my apologies, I'm here with uh, Trustee Andrew Gardenier of the Police and Fire Plan, a former chair of the Police and Fire Board. Um, so we take our fees very seriously, our expenses very seriously. We negotiate hard to reduce our fees. And you know, fees are really a function of asset allocation more than anything else. Um, but you know, we, do, we do have to pay our managers. And so this fee report includes not just the fees that we pay our managers, but it also includes other expenses like operating expenses, incentive fees, uh, staff salaries, consultants, custodian, and so on. And so this fee report is based on a calendar year basis as we have done in the past. And this is for calendar year 2022. And as you can see from this uh, slide here, 
the total fees paid was uh, 64.8 million. You can see that on the top half of this uh, slide. That's management incentive and operating expenses. And as uh, we have asset base of 8.1 billion among all four plans, that's the two pension plans as well as the healthcare trusts. And so that translates to about 80 basis points in total. And in the bottom half of that slide, you will see the other costs of running uh, our pension system, that's staff, salary, consultant, custodian, and so on. And that totals 5.8 million for a total of seven basis points. Now to put this in perspective, I'll go to the next slide. And as you can see on the left-hand side, our fees decreased from 21 to 22 from 1.55% to 0.8%. Now this looks really attractive, but it's not all good. So let's dig in uh, to this. Um, so you can see there's really three components to it, management fees, incentive fees, and operating expenses. So management fees were 56 basis points, and those are the fees that we can really control. And so they've been going down. Uh, it's gone up from last year slightly, but you know, over the long run, that's actually gone down. And there'll be another slide that explains why. Now you can see that the biggest change was in incentive fees. And last year, incentive fees were 94 basis points, and this year, it's only seven basis points. And when I say this year, I mean 2022. And the reason for that is you can see the performance below that. 2021 calendar year uh, return was 14.9%, and 2022 calendar year return was a negative 9.2%. So we ended up not paying a lot of incentive fees for our managers. So even though our fees have come down, you can see that was because the market was, market was down, and we ended up paying uh, less in terms of incentive fees. And the third component of it is operating expenses, and operating expenses actually went up from 10 basis points to 17 basis points. And the reason for that was twofold. One is our asset base was slightly down uh, because our returns were negative for calendar year 2022. And so when your asset base goes down, automatically your fees as a percentage goes up. So some of that was that. And also because we've, you know, we do have a sophisticated investment program, we do invest in private market assets, and private market assets actually bear higher fees. So operating costs went up from 10 basis points to 17 basis points. So for a total of, so it went down from 1.55% to 0.80%. And on the right side, you can see uh, our a comparison of our fees to other public agencies. And this is from the uh, ACFR report. Now the ACFR report has several limitations. Uh, it only includes directly invoiced fees and not separate account fees. So while it's not entirely accurate, at least it gives you some idea of where we are uh, compared to our public plan peers. And you can see ORS is the green bubble in there, and we are somewhere in the middle of the pack for our peers. So I, I mentioned before that the thing that we can really control is management fees, and how have we done this? Uh, we've done this by uh, two, twofold. Uh, the first thing is by adopting uh, greater uh, passive strategies. So where possible, we actually hire passive managers. And passive managers and passive strategies are those that replicate an index and carry a lot less in fees. As an example, you know, US large cap equity is an asset class which is very efficient and very hard to add value over the benchmark. And for those strategies, we actually adopt uh, passive managers. And so you can see here roughly 42% of all our uh, equity strategies are actually passive. So the fee breakdown, so the, the management fees in total is 59 basis points, of which 57 basis points are paid to active managers and two basis points to passive managers. And what, what is the breakdown of that uh, 57? You can see on the right side, about 18 basis points goes to long-only active managers, and about eight basis points goes to hedge fund managers, and about 32 basis points, which is the bulk of it, goes to private asset managers. Now, our management fee ratio as a whole, if you look at the last eight years, it has been trending down, though it has picked up in the last couple of years. So in 2015, it was 82 basis points combined for our plan. It's now about 61 basis points. The reason it's ticked up over the last couple of years is the greater adoption of 
private strategies. So we expect our fees to be somewhat in this ballpark going forward unless the boards decide to make a radical change in asset allocation. That concludes my presentation, Mr. Mayor. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Prabhu. Let's go to public comment first. I have no cards or hands for this item. Okay, coming back to council. Uh, Councillor Dewan, I have your hand up first. Uh, I move to accept the report. Okay. You said you move acceptance of the yes. report? Yes. Was there a second? Okay, second from Councillor Batra. Vice Mayor Kameh? Thank you. Um, so one of the things that you just mentioned is that um, where you have control is really on the management fees. And we all know that 2022 was a very bad down year. Um, and there was not a lot, a lot of information in the staff report itself. Uh, as a new person on this council, it would be very helpful to have a little bit more. Um, I, I will say that Roberto did uh, give an orientation, but for those of us who do not do this day in, day out, I think that it would be extremely helpful to have a little bit more detail in terms of how the two boards are able to take a look at, um, you know, what the, what the fees are, the structure, how it's going, uh, because, you know, I can see that um, the um, costs were reduced, but that was basically because of the incentives. Right? I mean, the majority of it is really just the incentives and the, um, let's see if I could find the, yes, uh, the majority of it was the incentives, but you still went up in operating expenses. So I don't know how much more was going on. Uh, and it just would be good information to know. This is one of the most, um, important, I think, in terms of looking at retirement services and the future of uh, the dollars that are spent uh, in, uh, uh, for our, our workforce uh, and those in retirement. So I'm just thinking that it would be very helpful to have a little bit more um, description and knowing how it all happened. Um, the previous years from uh, 2018, 2019, 2020 seemed to be a little bit more regular. And I know that um, it went up because of the incentives in uh, 2021. But, you know, I'm just, I'm just curious as to, as your board deliberates, um, you know, what are the things that they're looking at? What are the things that we could be informed? So I just say that by way of this being tremendously important. Uh, and you're right, it's very comprehensive. But I also believe that it would be uh, much more, um, at least for me, it would be much more helpful to know um, what are the, you know, what, what, what more is going on. So I don't know if that happens at your board meetings or whatever. I know we have a liaison uh, to both boards, but I just feel that it, it, um, it, it does need a little bit more than what was in the, in the um, staff report, which was not much. Okay, and when you say the staff report, you don't mean this presentation, but you mean the other two very comprehensive reports that were attached. No, 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 not the, not the reports itself, but a little bit more analysis I think would be helpful. Okay. For example, for example, um, the incentives obviously were down simply because uh, the, um, uh, the, the market was bad. I mean, we all know that 2022 was horrible, uh, but your operations went up. Why? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, during my presentation, it went up for two reasons. One is that the asset base went down. So if we pay the same dollar amount for a smaller asset base, then the percentage increases. And if, if you understand that. Yes. Okay. And secondly, because we, we are moving to a more complex investment program, so we do have private market investments. So between 21 and 22, we had a further increase in private market investments, and private market investments have higher operating expenses. And that provided greater returns? That we expect to provide greater returns going forward because private market investments are typically 10 to 15 years in horizon. Well, I guess we will see. 
We will see. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, Vice Mayor. Probably just a quick question for you. You know, uh, Warren Buffett famously uh, did the million dollar bet with the, offered it up to hedge funds over what I believe was a, a 10 year period to, to see who could beat the market. And uh, I think he pretty handily won that bet. So when we look at the active management and the higher management fees, uh, over the last 10 years, have we, have we beat the market? Yes, good question. So I do have the numbers for the last five years. I'll take um, the last five, although I think, the, I think the Warren Buffett bet was over yeah, 10. But that's when the I know you're cherry picking a little bit because I know two years ago was, uh, was, was a yeah, banner I, year, but go ahead. Yeah. I said five years because that's when the current investment team took over. And yeah. that's the report uh, okay. card that I have. All right, and fair so enough. I should also say this, right? Um, last year, you, you mentioned that 2022 was a horrible year. It was in terms of absolute return. But I should say that both plans finished in the top 30th percentile of our peers. 30th? Uh, 30th percentile in, in the entire country, not just in California. And on a five-year basis, fiscal year ending June 30th, 2023, the federated plan finished in the 19th percentile of all pension plans in the US. And the police and fire pension plan finished in the 39th percentile of all pension plans. And five years before, when the current investment team took over, we were in the bottom 1% of our peers. So I whatever remember. decisions the boards have done has actually worked uh, in our favor. So with that, uh, to answer your question, so the police and fire plan after fees and all costs on a five-year basis ending June 30th, 2023, returned 6.7% versus the benchmark of 6.3%. So we added 40 basis points annualized per year after a fees after and costs. That's from active management. Right. And the federated Similarly, the federated plan returns 7.4% versus the benchmark of 6.7%. So a good 70 basis points over the benchmark. So. All right. Very good. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Ah, Councilor Foley. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prabhu, and thank you, Drew, for being here. Uh, I really appreciate it, and having sat in on those meetings and listening to these presentations on the fund managers and their success over the years. Uh, I really appreciate this detail level of report and, and to the vice mayor's question, the trustees do look at this in detail and ask deep questions about the financing. We have a, an oversight role. This is a report that they give to us, but the trustees have a fiduciary role as they are looking at the benefit of the members and the, both the health care plan and the retirement fund. So I have a lot of confidence in this report and the report that's being presented to us. So thank you for being here and thank you for the presentation. Thank, thank you, council member. Okay, looks like that exhausts our questions. Let's vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much. Okay, we're on to item 4.1, San Jose Police Department canvas regulations, and we do have a staff presentation. And I do have a card for this one. All right, feel free to jump in when you're ready. Great. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council members, and members of the public. My name is Wendy Salazi, and I'm the Division Manager in the Police Department's Division of Cannabis Regulation. With me today is Sergeant David Woolsey and Rachel Roberts, Deputy Director of Code Enforcement. When we went to City Council on June 13th for zoning and regulatory changes, City Council directed staff to conduct a comprehensive review 
of the administrative citation schedule of fines for violations related to the cannabis regulatory program. We were directed to return first to the Public Safety, Finance, and Strategic Support Committee, and we were asked to compare San Jose's cannabis fines to similar California cities and provide recommendations to bring the cannabis fines more in line with comparable cities. We presented the proposed changes along with the city comparisons to the committee on October 19th and received the committee's support for our recommended changes. Fines related to San Jose's cannabis regulatory program were originally drafted in 2014 to encourage compliance with the new program and deter violations of the city's municipal code. When the fine structure was developed, the city was one of the first in the state to develop this type of program, and the state had not yet established a regulatory program for adult use in medical, uh, medicinal cannabis. The state began its regulatory program in 2018, and 16 cannabis businesses have been successfully registered and operating in San Jose since December 2015. Staff reviewed the fine schedules for cannabis-related violations for uh, various California cities, including Oakland, Sacramento, Redwood City, San Francisco, and Mountain View. While there's no uniform approach to violations, many cities do apply an escalation framework for repeat offenses. Cities typically start with a courtesy notice and then escalate to a citation similar to San Jose's violation framework. However, San Jose's fines were significantly higher. One important distinguish distinction between some of the cities reviewed in San Jose related to how the fines were enforced. San Jose uses administrative citations and other cities approach compliance and determinant with civil legal action. San Jose's current fines for cannabis violations is tiered with the lowest offenses starting at $1,200 and escalating to $5,000 with more significant offenses starting at $10,000 and escalating to $50,000. When we looked at the fines for violations related to off-sale alcoholic beverage establishments and tobacco retail violations in San Jose, we found those are typically tiered starting at $250 and $500 respectively. The purpose of establishing a fine schedule related to a regulated activity is to encourage compliance with the city's municipal code. Compliance can improve when administrative fines are reasonable and proportional to, to the violation being cited and when fines are escalated for repeat violations. As the regulatory environment has changed since the city's first established its cannabis-related violations in 2014, staff recommends updating and decreasing the schedule of fines. We believe the updates proposed will still continue to encourage compliance and deter violations. Staff proposes a four-tier uh, framework. Within each category, violations will continue to escalate, with the first violation being the lowest, uh, followed by increases for the second, third, and any subsequent violations within a 12-month period from the date of the previous violation. Staff also recommends a change to fines for personal cultivation. The current fine for personal non-medical cultivation over the limit is a flat fine of $2,500 for the first violation. Under this fine structure, a person cultivating one or two plants over the limit would be fined the same amount as someone cultivating 10 or 20 plants over the limit. Staff recommend changing violations to a per plant fine for personal non-medical cultivation of more than six plants per residence. Um, allowed under state law. Using a per plant fine would cause an individual's fine to scale with the egregiousness of the violation versus a flat fine for this type of activity. Staff reviewed the five administrative citations issued in fiscal year 2022-23. The fines totaled $45,000. Two were issued to illegal unregistered businesses and three citations were issued to registered businesses. Staff from the police department and code enforcement conduct regular inspections of the regulated businesses and respond to complaints from residents and businesses about non-compliant businesses. Staff refer complaints about illegal businesses to the state for enforcement. Staff proposes having the city align San Jose's allowed operating hours with what the state regulations allow. So that would change our hours um, to 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Staff strive for opportunities to make the regulatory processes less burdensome for the industry. So during the evaluation of violation fine amounts, we assess the identification badge requirements. 
We recommend updating the badge collection process, including time allowances for businesses to return employee badges to the chief of police. And we just recently rolled out a new streamlined renewal process for the identification badges. Staff held a meeting with the businesses on October 2nd, and here you see some of the feedback we received. The businesses supported softening the fine schedule, and they requested to have the city align San Jose's allowed operating hours with what the state regulations allowed. And additionally, the industry requested historical information regarding enforcement actions, and staff worked with the requesting parties and the city's Public Records Act request team to provide that information on October 18th. One of the things that became um, clear to us during the public safety committee meeting was that it was unclear to people where to go for resources if you had questions or concerns. So we wanted to include in our presentation here, and we plan to include this also on our webpage, uh, where to go if you have concerns. Um, for in San Jose, for our, for our police department, if you see uh, if you witness drug dealing occurring outdoors or on the street, such as sales of cannabis, mushrooms, fentanyl, other illegal substances, substances, of course we want you to call 911. If you suspe suspect drug dealing but don't actually see it, there's a con online contact form, and under that drop down, we ask that you um, drop, select drug enforcement and narcotics. And if you have concerns about the regulated um, businesses that are registered in our city, of course you can come to the Division of Cannabis Regulation. And if you have concerns about um, cannabis violations, um, including unregistered cannabis businesses, cannabis cultivated for personal use, or odor from cannabis, um, the city's Code Enforcement Division will handle those and the contact information is there. And then um, if the, the state is our biggest partner when it comes to illegal uh, cannabis business activity in our city, so um, we would request that you file a complaint with the state. They have a website where you file um, your concerns and you can include your name or be anonymous, and then they take as much information as you have, including pictures of products you've purchased somewhere or pictures of an illegally operating business. Again, any information you have um, they'll take it. Um, and then also when it comes to um, tobacco enforcement, there's the Department of Public Health, Food, and Drug Branch. And our staff recommendations are here as well as in the memo. And so with that, that concludes our presentation and we're available for questions. Great, thank you. Appreciate that. We'll go to public comment first. Dan and Sean. Mayor Mahan, council members, good afternoon. My name is Dan Jurjadis for the past 10 years. I have represented Purple Lotus. It's a cannabis business in District 3 uh, near Highway 101 and Interstate 880 uh, interchange. During this time, I've had the honor to work with dedicated public servants, such as former Mayor Chuck Reed, uh, Sergeant David Woolsey, Division Manager Wendy Salasi, in building uh, what the city has built as a, a gold standard for cannabis regulatory programs in the United States. We are here today to maintain that position. SJPDR, SJ, SJPD DCR, along with the current operators, prevent youth cannabis access while providing lab-tested, duly taxed cannabis products to the public. These goals have overwhelmingly been supported by the people of the state time and time again. Purple Lotus enthusiastically supports the softening of the fine schedule and the aligning of the allowed operating hours with the state regulations. These are very positive changes to the program. Purple Lotus also supports a robust division of cannabis regulation with perhaps even a larger regulatory enforcement scope. This scope especially be related to two issues of great public safety and health concern. 
The first is the proliferation of smoke shops across the city who flout state and federal law by selling hemp and, and synthetic THC products that are inhalable and edible. They also sell, still sell flavored tobacco. These synthetic products are not tracked, not lab tested, not taxed, and are very likely being sold to persons aged 18 to 20, which we know will go into the community's high schools. The second issue is that of state licensed cannabis businesses outside the city of San Jose who are not registered with the DCR coming into the city's jurisdiction. Anything that can be done to change this enforcement landscape would be welcomed by Purple Lotus. Thank you, that's your time. Next speaker. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Sean Kelly Rye, Silicon Valley Cannabis Alliance. Uh, we've been working with staff and the uh, Lee from the city manager's office and had a robust dialogue about this particular issue, uh, item 4.1, which is about the fine reduction, increase in the hours, and the other uh, regulatory changes. And the industry is wholeheartedly in support of the staff recommendation. We uh, hope that you will move approval of this item. Item 4.3 was deferred. Uh, or actually, I should say, referred back to PISFIS committee, and that will be coming back to you, and that's going to be a much more robust conversation about uh, what the prior speaker was talking about is youth access to cannabis and some of the other perils that are, we are now seeing with the increase. Uh, but for this particular item, since this is the item in front of us, uh, we would move approval and thank staff for their, for their uh, work in reaching out with the industry, and we wholeheartedly support the fine reduction, increase in hours, and the other uh, regulatory changes. Thank you. Back to council. Great, thank you. Councilor Jimenez? Yeah, I think it's all been said. I think uh, Sean touched on uh, 4.3 that uh, if you were following the agenda, it was deferred at, uh, at the beginning of the meeting. Um, and uh, certainly here to answer any questions about the memo that came before PISVIS, but uh, I want to move staff's recommendation. Okay. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to share my thanks to staff for bringing forward the recommendations that should hopefully help the cannabis industry here in, in San Jose. Uh, unfortunately, the over-regulation of legal cannabis has allowed for illegal markets to flourish and given space for many of the fears that our community has uh, regarding kind of cannabis. I'm especially concerned about the over concentration of smoke and vape shops, um, which have been illegally selling cannabis, uh, nitrous oxide, and in some occasions even uh, mushrooms. And I've, I've seen this personally. Um, I, I believe we need to advocate for the regulation uh, of these items um, in the smoke shop and vapor shop settings um, instead of over regulating legal uh, cannabis. Um, which I believe has many safeguards in, in, in place. I'm also supportive of this idea that's been floating around about having the Division of Cannabis Control take in smoke shops into their regulatory purview, uh, armed with compliance tools from our code enforcement department. Um, I also just want to raise it further as I'm deeply interested in a moratorium on business licenses for smoke shops. Uh, you can throw a stone in East San Jose and hit a smoke shop. Then right next to the smoke shop is a liquor store. And then shortly, a short distance away from that is a fast food joint on any given street in, in my district. And that shouldn't be the reality for our residents in, in East San Jose. Uh, lastly, we've seen legal cannabis underperform and the illegal markets flourish, partly due to steep regulation and arbitrary penalties like the ones we are amending today, uh, and a misalignment of what is truly the issue at hand. Uh, today's action is a step in the right direction, and I look forward to further conversations on this topic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Duan. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, staff, for the report. I have a few questions. On the fine that last year, a total of $45,000. Two were illegal businesses, and three were registered businesses. Can you break down, have a breakdown on that? What was their violation, and what was the total amount for the illegal versus the registered business? 
I, I'm guessing, I think that for the illegal businesses, it starts at a $10,000 fine for being unregistered. So I would um, say that those two were, were 10,000 each. Um, do you have that, Rachel? Sorry. And then the three for the registered businesses, they were related to um, doing some construction without permits, um, not having a valid badge, working with an expired badge, um, having an officer work for the business without being backgrounded. And so um, typically those start with warnings, but then if, if they um, continue to not follow the rules, then we will issue citations. And I, I want to say those were... I think, well, actually, I think for the illegal businesses, I think it was escalated, which caused the dollar amount. Do we have the chart? Yeah. So, sorry, I can pull up the chart if you just give me a second. So each, sorry, um, there were two violations per each illegal business. So each one was $15,000. So that added up to the 30,000 and then the other 15,000 were uh, for the three registered businesses. Okay, thank you. What is considered more egregious violation where it's 10 to $50,000 fine? Um, that would be, um, well, not being registered. Um, so operating illegally or um, selling to someone who's under 21. So beside the fine for the illegal businesses, do we have process where we not only the fine, but we also shut them down and not allow them to ever apply for another application? Thank you, Council Member. Rachel Roberts, Deputy Director of Code Enforcement. So if it's, um, are you referring to illegally operating businesses? Yes. Um, so for that, um, we normally would start with a citation. Um, as, as we know, those um, fines are pretty hefty. Um, if we were not getting compliance, however, through the citations, we would begin our administrative remedy process, which includes a compliance order um, where they could uh, face fines per day. If they, we continue to see that they are not closing down as a result of that compliance order or those citations, then we would work with our attorney's office to do a, a legal action. All right, thank you. And then, if you, part of your presentation, if you witness a illegal drug transaction, uh, you dial 911. Uh, I just want to know, is the, the, the actually get dispatched, but the, is the police officer going to respond to that? Good afternoon, it's David, Sergeant David Woolsey with the police department. It would depend on call volume and the priority of calls at the time. So if there is absolutely nothing going on, absolutely officers could be dispatched to that. If there are higher priority crimes in progress, the things that they're investigating, crimes of violence, crimes against children, anything like that, that call might have to pend until there's op officers available. Thank you. And regarding meeting the state requirement, is there any other pros and cons when we accept this report? For the operating hour change? Yes. Or any other pros and cons besides the operating hour, complying with the state, um, with similarity, and so on? And on hours specifically, we're coming into, sorry, into uh, compliance with, or, or alignment, I should say, we're coming into alignment with the state's current regulations on hours, is that correct? Yeah, so b by making the change for the 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., we would be matching what the state regulations currently allow. 
Um, that's, that's the one um, that we looked at right now. We have been directed to go back to the Public Safety Committee, which we'll be going back in February with a more thorough evaluation of the rest of um, our regs, uh, regulations um, compared to the state. But um, by allowing the businesses to be operating at the hours that the state allows, then that puts them, you know, at a more competitive advantage um, with other businesses, and that allows people to, you know, go on their way to work and on their way home um, if they are, you know, choosing to buy cannabis products. So it just puts them more in alignment with, with what other cities do allow. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. I think that exhausts our questions. Thank you all. Let's vote. Motion passes unanimously. Great. Thank you. So as Councilor Jimenez noted, we uh, voted at the beginning of the meeting to, under or orders of the day, to defer item 4.3, which will go to a future meeting of the Public Safety and Strategic Support Services Committee. So we were on item 4.2, we have a staff presentation. This is the response to the investigations of police misconduct in San Jose report by Mole, Law, and Fakuri. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Lee Wilcox, Assistant City Manager, and joining me in the box today is Karen Sununu Towery, our acting independent police auditor. We're here today to present uh, this, the city's MLF report, which makes recommendations for improving the independent oversight of law enforcement within San Jose, as well as policy alternatives around strengthening police oversight. And we're here to present the recommendations that the Public Safety, Finance, and Strategic Support Committee made last month. As background, this project was initiated in August of 2020 when the City Council directed the City Manager and Independent Police Auditor to provide the City Council with recommendations for how the IPA would take over investigations of police misconduct from the Department's Internal Affairs Unit. City Manager and IPA returned to Council in March of 2021 with a work plan as well as direction that included procuring a consultant to develop recommendations to be considered around police uh, uh, of the firm MLF and started work underway in June of 20. This month, the Public Safety and uh, Finance Strategic Support Committee accepted the MLF report and rejected the report's recommended hybrid model and directed staff to pursue policy alternatives to strengthen the existing model of oversight, um, mostly around additional resources and possible process improvements, which we'll go into. They also cross-referenced this matter to the full council, which is why we're here in front of you today. As far as background, our current model, there's three entities that oversee and review police misconduct allegations. The first is our own Internal Affairs Department and the San Jose Police Department that investigates police misconduct, while our independent police auditor audits those investigations to ensure that they are complete, thorough, objective, and fair. As part of that work, the IPA can give input regarding the allegations to be investigated, participate in all investigation and interview, um, components as well as request additional witnesses to be interviewed and have access to all recordings and documents which make up the investigation in its entirety. The city manager's office of employee relations also investigates alleged misconduct of city employees and includes the police department sworn and non-sworn employees. OER investigates uh, investigations typically focus on violations of the city's administrative policy manual and or other investigations deemed appropriate by the city manager, director of employee relations, or the police chief. In addition to the city's own oversight model, San Jose Police, De uh, San Jose Police Department officers are subject to oversight from the California State Commission on Peace Officers Standards and Training, or POST. Similarly, in, in California, uh, one year or two years ago, Senate Bill 2 passed and became effective in January of 2022, 
and that established new oversight mechanism by empowering posts to receive and investigate complaints of officer misconduct from the public. If post deems that serious misconduct occurred, it can uh, direct law enforcement officers or revoking their ability to work in law enforcement agencies throughout the entire state of California. And posts started to do this in June of this year, statewide. The report in front of you today from MLF analyzes the advantages and disadvantages of three potential oversight models. The first is San Jose's current model, which is our internal affairs model, which under this model, police department, internal affairs unit does investigate misconduct uh, within the police department through, as we've talked about, um, the IPA is a part of these and audits those investigative investigative functions, while OER takes a role in investigation, a civilian oversight model. And under this model, all police misconduct investigations would be conducted by civilians who are independent of the police department. It also analyzed and gave recommendations, ultimations continue uh, by the law enforcement agency or internal affairs, while other MLF ultimately cited and made this recommendation that it really combined both uh, where we could rely on training, experience of police officers, specifically around use of force and other misconduct, while in, uh, the inclusion of civilians brought a certain level of independence um, outside of the normal chain of command. As I mentioned, this was uh, reported to uh, the Public Safety Finance uh, Committees um, last month. Ultimately, the committee gave direction to cross-reference this and look specifically at policy alternatives. So when this is front of the council in December of 2022, ultimately council had directed that staff come back to the committee in the spring with not only additional analysis of the MLF report, but around implementation, like what would it take in the way of implementing this? And if there are implementation hurdles, also give the council additional policy alternatives um, to look through. And I should say, as I move forward, that we're gonna walk through some of these and, and these policy alternatives aren't mutually exclusive. It's, it's not an either or. Some of these can be pursued even if the council wanted to pursue the hybrid model. And in some of these cases, which I'll walk through, we've started to implement some of them already as they were mostly uh, found with recommendations from the MLF report. MLF proposed the hybrid model, so it did change IPA's function uh, while leaving the city's other oversight entities unchanged. So under the hybrid model, the IPA would have the discretion to independently conduct police misconduct investigations on their own. This report recommends that three investigators be added to the IPA's office to perform this role. Internal Affairs Unit in the Police Department and OER would continue to conduct investigations into alleged misconduct as well. So one of the steps that we would need to do under this model is Internal Affairs, as well as the IPA, would need to coordinate and come up with a framework so how complaints would be received and determine which entity would investigate those complaints. As noted in the memorandum, there are several uh, major obstacles to implementing this proposal, uh, one of them being the meet and confer process as well as the budgetary process, uh, depending on what the budget uh, scenario is in the coming year. So it's difficult to predict how long a meet and confer process or uh, what the budget will look like in the coming years, which is one of the uh, reasons the council in December of 2022 uh, asked for policy alternatives for the council to consider. Staff has developed policy alternatives that are designed to strengthen the current oversight model. These come around and fall really into three categories. Uh, increasing IPA staff, staff in the Office of Employee Relations, as well as process improvements. For increasing the IPA staff, uh, ultimately the policy alternative that uh, staff would recommend if the council wanted to explore this would be one additional analyst in 
the Independent Police Auditor's Office, and we'd add two additional staff in the Office of Employee Relations. For process improvements, and largely where a bulk of these um, improvements have been located, again, do come from the MLF report and could be included in the current model. The first is recommendation 11 from the report, which recommends that the IPA be given unfettered access to any documents related to an incident being investigated. The administration and the department do agree with this recommendation and have already implemented this in coordination with the acting IPA. Second is recommendation seven from the MLF report. It recommends that the uh, in internal affairs and the IPA work closely to ensuring joint operating procedures are documented. Both the administration and IPA agree with this and are in close alignment around coordinating uh, the need for coordination between the two is essential and um, important for transparency as well as timely reports and audit reports and investigations. This effort is currently underway um, to uh, ensure both IPA unit guidelines are finished and I, I'm sorry, IA guidelines are finished and IPA procedures manual is finished in the coming weeks. Recommendation two from the MLF report rec uh, recommends that steps taken to reduce turnover in IA to enhance the continuity of operations in the uh, internal affairs unit of the police department. The department does agree um, of, of a two year term or tenure for an officer or sergeant in internal affairs is very crucial for institutional memory and for those investigations. So if directed by the council to pursue this, this would be a meet and confer issue that we would meet with the Police Officers Association. And last but not least, the fourth recommendation, which is also recommendation four from the report, that both the IPA and Internal Affairs Unit coordinate and undertake regular community outreach to increase community understanding of the investigation process. And staff is currently in the process of doing that. So again, we're here to present this report and seek feedback. Uh, council can give direction to pursue the, the hybrid model and we would uh, kick that off by the city manager uh, needing to meet and confer with the Police Officers Association over that. Um, and like I said, the policy alternatives, um, it's not an either or, you can give direction on those as well. Um, what we recommend, um, so that you guys can make an informed decision around policy alternatives if you would like to pursue those is the ones uh, with staffing that you ask us to bring forward a manager's budget addendum as part of the budget process with those staffs out, uh, those cost outlines so that you can make that decision um, in the scope of the entire budget. And then uh, for most of the process improvements, other than the tenure and in the internal affairs unit, uh, staff has discretion to move forward with those process improvements now. So with that, staff is available for any questions the council may have. Thank you, Lee. Appreciate the report. Tony, do we have any public comment? You have Kat Alvarez and Steve Slack. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm Catherine Alvarez, Vice President of the San Jose POA. Using your ability to establish policy with regard of how the Office of the Independent Police Auditor conducts its, its important work and will allow the new IPA to hit the ground running and will provide a clearer picture of what the City Council expects in any IPA applicant. The POA supports adding additional staff to expedite case review and meet statutory guidelines. The POA supports the creation of policy and procedures manual and ongoing training of IPA staff. The POA supports a formal MOU between the department and the IPA on meeting important timelines so the IPA can have ample time to do its job. And the POA supports the council determining how far back the unethical practice of automatically categorizing cases without reviewing them. What the POA does not support is the elimination of our internal affairs unit and replacing it with pri private contractors. This is a solution in search of a problem and will have a chilling impact on our recruiting. Please do not put, punt this item another day. We respectfully request that you reject the hybrid model today. It's time to take steps to strengthen the current IPA model. By doing so, you set up a new IPA for success. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker.
Good afternoon, Mayor and uh, Council. I'm Steve Slack, Sergeant President of the San Jose POA. And as you're all very much aware, uh, San Jose PD is in a national struggle to recruit and retain police officers. Our understaffing rears its ugly head when our officers must work overtime just to perform basic patrol functions daily. I remind you of this as you contemplate keeping alive the hybrid option model for investigating alleged police misconduct. This private contractor model hanging over the heads of those of us that remain with San Jose PD harms morale and it provides additional uncertainty into the lives of police officers. Kicking the can down the road on this private contractor hybrid model will have a chilling impact on the recruitment of new officers that are in such high demand by every police department in this state. There is no trust for private contractors to take over the important work that's performed by our dedicated internal affairs unit. The data does not support moving to a hybrid model. Keeping this idea alive will harm retention and will negatively impact our recruiting. I humbly ask the mayor and council to accept recommendations two and three contained council member Jimenez's memo regarding staffing and the police and policy procedure manual for their office and to explicitly reject the hybrid model from any future consideration. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Back to council. Great. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Council member Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I also want to share gratitude to the firm that uh, worked to produce today's report and the staff, uh, Lee, for giving that report. Um, there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the comments of my colleagues and, and wanted to pose my own questions as well. It's my understanding that in 2020, San Jose voters aimed to strengthen civilian oversight of SJPD through Measure G. To that end, would it be necessary to amend the city charter to proceed with implementing the hybrid model? If anybody can answer that. Thank you, Council. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member. I think uh, that's probably a question for me. Um, a meet and confer process would be required, but our office has opined that it would not be necessary to amend the charter. So it would not, but you would need a meet and confer. Okay. Thank you. And based on the memo presented to the PISFIS committee, policy alternatives to consider if the council chooses not to proceed with the hybrid model include process improvements to the, to the current existing model. Page eight of the memo establishes that standard operating procedures currently stand as pending. What steps will the uh, independent police auditor and internal affairs take to coordinate establishing standard operating procedures um, and what may uh, that timeline look like? I think I can answer that. Yeah. Thank you, Councilman. Um, I have, um, Along with Lieutenant Zuniga of Internal Affairs, we have um, started the draft process of that. Um, I was very surprised to find there was nothing in place. Yeah, yeah. And um, we are both very anxious to get that in place. And I, this morning, told the chief it would be done by the end of the year. Oh, OK. I, I appreciate that. I think that goes down to like making sure that reports are passed over at the right time and I know that we were talking about how you know sometimes those reports are passed over click to the uh, very close to the time in which you know complaints would need to be raised so I'm really happy to hear that we'll see some progress on that before the end of the year uh, it's also come to my attention as discussed during the PISFIS committee meeting that the IPA currently does not have the capacity to participate um, in witness interviews with that in mind, what is the feasibility of uh, adding additional staff to ensure the IPA has the capacity to participate in all witness interviews and fulfill uh, other essential tasks? Well, the addition of another auditor would make an enormous difference to our ability to attend 100% of the interviews. Mm -hmm. Currently, we are not able to between the work we have to do and the written materials and taking in complaints, I would 
I would guess right now we're attending about 80% of the interviews. Okay. And it's one of the strongest tools we've been given by the city is to attend every interview and not only be at the interview, but to proactively ask questions. Mm -hmm. And so um, to have that additional auditor would really complete our toolbox. Okay, I, I appreciate that. And is, are you aware of any measures uh, that we can take to secure these funding? Is there grants out there? Would, would this have to wait till, I guess we'd have to go through the budget cycle? Yeah, I think you would have to go through the budget okay. cycle. It would be general fund funded. Okay, well, you know, that being said, thank you, thank you for your answers. Really appreciate that. Also appreci appreciate my colleague's memo um, asking for the deferment. I, I personally just, uh, I don't know if it would change the outcome. Honestly, if, if we deferred this item, I, I personally feel like it, it's a little bit of kicking, down, kicking the can down the road. And I may think differently, you know, if this room was filled with like advocates asking for this policy change, but I don't really see anybody here in the room asking for it and like demanding it. Um, so I'll, I'll listen to my colleagues talk, uh, but that's kind of like where, where my thoughts are. I don't necessarily want to kick it down the road because I don't know if the decision would, would change by doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Batra. All right, thank you. In the FISBIS, uh, FISBIS uh, committee, we discussed at length that how the process has been working currently and what the deficiencies were and even the privileges which were available to IPA were not being fully utilized for various reasons. And one of the reasons you discussed, Council Member, right now, the adequacy of resources. And four to one, that committee made the decision that what we need is not a new model we need to just make our model, which we currently have, work better, work more effectively, and overcome the gaps which we have identified in terms of the processes not being documented. I've seen the memo written by my colleagues asking for the deferment. Let's look at it, what the deferment will do for us. The deferment will make uncertain how the IPA is going to work in future. And when we have to hire an IPA, we will not be describing to that IPA what the job and the role and the model is going to be. We're going to be asking that person to take a leap of faith that the model which we choose to work under would be the model which that person is comfortable with and may not really like to work for us, it is the responsibility of the council to make the decision now. I believe it's a golden opportunity that when we don't have a permanent IPA to be able to make the right choice, we do not have to worry about at the moment whether this person likes that model or not. We get the IPA after we have made the choice what model we are going to be comfortable with, what the city of San Jose likes it to be, and then we interview and hire a person, giving them the proper job description, and hence they only take the job if they are comfortable with the proposal we have in front of them. Kicking the can down the road, creating an uncertainty of the job description for the person who's going to be coming isn't really the right thing to do. We have enough information. We've discussed it enough. And what more are we waiting for? We have the experts given the opinion. We have it deliberated at the FISBES. It's the time to take the decision. And I like the recommendations written in the um, memo, number two and three, but I totally disagree with the one, number one. So I would move the motion to accept the FISBIS recommendation along with the memo, 
is the recommendation two and three. Okay, so we have a motion to support the recommendation coming out of the public safety and strategic support, sorry, public safety finance and strategic support committee, second by the vice mayor. Anything else, Councilman? I just to conclude my sure. comment. So the primary reason why I'm objecting to that deferment is I do not want to have the opportunity to give a person who is going to get hired not know what his or her job description is going to be. That will not yeah. be productive for us and Got will it. not be productive for the person who comes forward. And thank you, Council Member. And, and just to clarify, that is the, uh, the recommendation was the staff alternative, so not the hybrid model. And then it sounded like, and I just want to clarify, of the group memo put forward by Council Members Jimenez, Torres, Cohen, and Foley, sounded like you supported RECs 2 and 3, which included an MBA on evaluating additional positions for the IPA. Yes. And directing the IPA to create policy and procedures manual before hiring a new IPA. Yes. Do you include those recommendations? 100%. Okay. Is the, Without okay, doubt. Is that, was that the seconder's understanding? Yes. Great. Okay, we have a motion. Vice Mayor, did you have any additional comments or questions, or should I continue? Um, I do. Please. Um, this was discussed extensively at the um, Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support Committee, and um, I think that uh, one of the things that we realized is that if you went down the road of a hybrid, and yes, you know, it's gonna take a lot longer, number one, Number two, sometimes, you know, I've been asking myself, how do you audit the auditor? How do you get an auditor to audit the auditor? And uh, it becomes a little bit cumbersome, uh, you know, with, with that kind of uh, uh, potential model. So I think that um, the, the best options right now is really to strengthen the IPA, give it the support it needs, as has been mentioned in item number two of the um, memo from Jimenez, Torres, Cohen, and Foley. And I think that that'll help tremendously. So thank you for that. Great, thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilor Jimenez? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so I'm on the Public Safety Committee. That day that we had a very, well, I wouldn't say we, well, we, I guess the committee, had a very robust discussion about the topic. Uh, I didn't say a whole lot, just because I knew it was gonna be cross-reference, and so, um, you know, there wasn't a unanimous vote. Uh, I, I didn't support sort of moving forward with the recommendation. Uh, just a few things that come to mind, and I wanna share with you why. I'm, in, I'm interested in deferring. I'm not sure, really, if it would give us a different outcome, quite frankly, to some of the points that have been made. <laughs> I realize that, uh, but I think it's important just to share some perspectives and, and to, to remind us about some of the work that the consultant did. The first thing I would say is that there's been mention of this is the right approach, this is the right thing to do, and I think that's very subjective as it relates to what's the right thing. And so um, I just wanted to point that out because right to me can be wrong to someone else and you know so on and so forth. The other thing I wanted to share is that uh, when we talk about having experts in the room, certainly the police officers are experts, IA folks doing the investigations, uh, but the other person I think would be an expert in the room, uh, once hired, is our next IPA. And that's, that's the reason I think a deferral is important, is that we actually get uh, that expert that we're going to hire uh, as a council uh, to come in and run the office and get their perspective as to what model they think we should be utilizing or what can be more effective. Um, additionally, I think if we did it that way, it would create buy-in by the person that we're hiring in that it would give them the opportunity to shape the office to a certain extent. Um, and the other, the other thing that I think is important to, to, to remember as we go down the road in making this decision is that w what I fear, obviously, it's very clear to all of us that there's been some turbulence within the IPA office. <laughs> um, I know there's been comments from some of the POA folks that you know we need to look back and, and evaluate and audit, I guess, what's been happening. And, and I agree with you. I think it's important to see what has been legitimate and what, you know, and what has gone wrong in the office with some of the reports and, and, and the yearly reports spe specifically. But I also, what I don't want to see is the damage to the office because I also, similarly to when we have a police officer that does something wrong, 
I don't want it to taint the whole department, and I know it doesn't taint the whole department, because I know there's a lot of great officers out there, but there are some folks that do something wrong. And so likewise, I'm not interested in having the IPA office be damaged by behavior of former IPAs. And so I fear that when we, when we begin to use language that, you know, to, to sort of suggest that, the, that everything that the former IPA has touched has sort of gone to hell, and isn't worth anything is just the wrong approach, and I think we need to be very thoughtful as to uh, we move forward in that. Um, the other thing that I worry about is that we here are, I'm interested in deferring, and certainly I'm partial to, to the hybrid model, but I think we here are, are, what I hear us doing and what I see us doing is making long-term decisions based on temporary hurt that the office is going through. And I have real concerns that that is, in fact, what's potentially, no one has expressed that, but driving some of these decisions uh, that are going to really uh, shape the office for years to come based on some of the immediate issues that we've encountered as, an off as, as the, IPA, the IPA office. The other thing, I just wanted to read a few things that were in the report that I think are worth lifting up. And as I was going through the report, it had been some time because we've been kicking this around since November 2022, I think. It's been some time. And so I just wanted to read a little bit about what the consultant put in here to refresh our memory as to where, where, how we got here and why this is important. So just one of the things on page 15, it says proper investigation of officer misconduct allegations is the cornerstone of demonstrating to the public and internal stakeholders that, that the department is committed to the highest level of integrity when it comes to serving communities. The other thing I wanted to share is on page 19, you know, because the IPA office has been in existence since 1993. And I know Ms. Sununu Towery has expressed her perspective, which I appreciate and respect, uh, because I think maybe at some point you even, I'm trying to re refresh my memory as to what you said, that the auditing function seemingly is what we need, and those are, the, we have the tools essentially already to do a job. But I wanted to sort of harken back to what they put in this report, and the, and the consultant said this, and again, We've had an IPA office since 1993. It's been a little while. They said, past IPAs believe strongly that having civilian investigators housed in the IPA's office or elsewhere in the city would be an important way to strengthen the investigative process and ensure objective investigations. The input collected from civilian oversight professionals indicated that a skilled, dedicated investigatory unit would provide a more objective review than personnel with professional and potentially personal connections to the subjects of investigations. It was also suggested that at minimum, at minimum, the existence of independent civilian investigators could mitigate the perception or concern that officers may be motivated to disregard or downplay allegations of misconduct. To me, that sort of in a nutshell tells us why going down the road and exploring different models is important. It's important. And, uh, and so I'll leave it at that. I, I think I've said enough. I'd like to hear from other colleagues, but I just think it's wrong to, to sort of put this on the shelf and not do it because, to be honest with you, I fear that we're never going to have another opportunity as a city to go down this road and explore a different model. And I think we're foregoing this very special uh, place and time in which we can open it up and, and figure out what the best approach is. And so I think today, if we vote this down rather than defer it, we're essentially foregoing that opportunity, not allowing the future IPA who's gonna be hired sometime in the not too distant future from chiming in and expressing to us as the expert, as the professional, not us, but as the expert professional, what they think should be the approach of the office. And so with that, uh, again, I'm not gonna, I was inclined to do a substitute motion, but I have a sense as to where the votes are. Uh, but I, I appreciate all the comments, respect all opinions from the police department, everyone up here, but I just think that, um, you know, I think we could do better. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Dewan. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate um, Council Member Jimenez rationalizing. And I think it's just important that we, at this point, support our San Jose Police Department and, and encourage our robust IPA office to continue the diligent work. At this point, it, we're not, it doesn't mean what we make the decision today. It can't be changed in the future if there's something wrong. I believe that our IA 
and our police department doing a great job. And it doesn't mean that the IPA can't look at some of these complaints and reports and, and, and dig into it and, and give it their recommendation. And I think it's important that while encouraging the, the best practice, we give our IPA a clear expectation what their procedure and jobs that they need to do. But it's also allow our police department to have to trust the integrity that it deserves. And so I just want to clarify that today we, we are rejecting the, the, the staff memo and we reaffirming the decision in PISFIS um, to keep the IPA model as is currently correct and also to accept item two and three from our uh, council members. I think it would be the rejection of the hybrid model proposed by the consultant. I, I don't think it's a rejection of the staff memo, just to clarify. But, but the, the suggestion here is to go with staff's proposed alternative, which was supported by a, I believe, four to one vote, a majority vote of the Public Safety, Finance, and Strategic Support Committee. That alternative is an alternative to the hybrid model that the consultant had proposed and instead focuses on the other investments that were outlined in the presentation we just saw that could be uh, actioned through the budget next year. Also includes clarifying process mutually between the department and the IPA in a way that um, I certainly think would be, would be very helpful to all, just to make sure the IPA has adequate time and access to the information they need to uh, perform their audit function. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Yes, you're welcome. Any other questions? No, nope, that's it. All Thank right. You. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Foley. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, and uh, Karen, thank you for the briefing that I had with you a couple of weeks ago that was really helpful in understanding the issue, not having sat on PISFIS and listening to what seems like a robust conversation there. Um, I did have a couple of clarifying questions for you regarding the uh, participating in the witness interviews. Is that a capacity issue more so than you've been denied access to the interviews? I just want to clear that, clarify that. We have never been denied access to an interview. San Jose gives us notice and um, before Measure G, we were in the room, and after Measure G, we were allowed to ask questions with agreement with the San Jose Police Department. So um, it's lack of staff that we haven't been able, so we're kind of triaging it. If it's a very minor offense, we aren't going. If it's uh, something we think is more egregious, we're in there, or more complicated. So, and we're asking questions. And I think we're making a difference. I, I spoke to the chief this morning and he quoted some questions I had raised at one of the interviews. So I think we're making a difference, a big difference. Great, I, I appreciate that. And the same thing with any documentation that you wanna see, you have access to that that's not being withheld. You have total access to any of the cases that Internal Affairs is looking at if you've triaged it and determined that it's something risen to the level that you want to take a look at given the capacity that you have. That's correct. We are currently auditing every complaint that comes in, whether it comes in to the police department or to, to our IPA. We actually have a shared database and we have unfettered access to everything. So that includes body-worn camera footage, any photographs, police reports, complaints, the, uh, inter the complaint tape, inter recorded interview. So we have full access to everything. Thank you. So, well, so it seems to me that the system is working. You just don't have enough staff. So are you in the process of hiring staff? I recall our conversation that you were in the process of hiring. Was it two staff people you were looking to right. hire? Yeah. We, that are already you're funded for. Yeah, so we have we were funded under Measure G, 
so that we could do data analytics on the use of force cases. Now, the use of force cases don't necessarily come to us as complaints. San Jose Police Department has made all those reports available to us, even though they don't come as complaints. Measure G allowed us to do analytics on that, and no one was ever hired, so we just posted for that, and we will have um, another analyst to help us with data analytics. Okay, great, and once you hire them, then you'll be able to analyze the data of uh, Especially use of force. the use of force and probably the other data that we are we are collecting. I mean, we are really this is this. Mo I can't explain how strong this model is. We're we're in it from the beginning. We're giving uh, we're, we're asked about the allegations because the allegations define the investigation. San Jose PD takes our input. Thank you. Your comments are really compelling to me, having jumped into the office that had some issues when you jumped in, having uh, analyzed what needs to be done, and I think you're the one who mentioned that we need a policy and procedures manual. <laughs> yes. And that would help you and help the future IPA. So with that, I'm going to support the motion on the table, even though initially I did co-author the memo to defer, I see no uh, need to do that as it seems the system is working except we need a couple of things you need more staffing and you need and which we need to analyze through the budget process and you need a policy and procedures manual thank you with that I'm I'm finished thank you mayor thank you council member uh, councilor Batra back to you again I, I did want to comment on um, my colleague council member Hamanas brought up some very important point and his biggest point was for deferring is that we will have the buy-in of the new IPA who comes on board. And that is normally a very good requirement, except in this case, once we make the decision, we will be hiring the new IPA. That IPA is going to know beforehand what model this council chose, what this city would like to see it happen. If that IPA does not have a buy-in of his desire to work in that model, he or she won't take our job. So in this case, we will be very fortunate that we will be getting an IPA who really believes in the system they will be working in. So I'm not concerned at this particular point about not being able to have the buy-in of the person who is actually going to be performing the job. Otherwise, Council Member Jimenez, I would have certainly tried to do something to achieve that. But in this case, I feel pretty comfortable. In fact, I consider it to be a golden opportunity to be able to make this decision and then go and hire the IPA who fully understands how we are going to be working or what they will be expected to do. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and we're back to Councilor Jimenez. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ms. Unitari, I know you, you've mentioned uh, time and again sort of you, your, your perspective. Is, it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong as I say this, we have all the tools. This is a sort of... A, uh, a model that currently exists that gives that, that that is that is ideal for for really um, and auditing and making sure that everything's done sort of as it should. Uh, is that is that is that your sense of of the current model that we have? Well, well, it's correct, and I I've enjoyed that as far as um, appealing some decisions and having a back and forth and having the police department changed the outcome of cases. So it's, yes, it's a very powerful auditing tool. And do you, and do you um, assuming, because I'm of the mind, like I, I assume everyone up here, is that we need to resource the office, we need more bodies, we need to be doing some of that work. Um, and, and that would only strengthen what you perceive to be a, a, a good model, which I assume be just based on- That's correct. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think that would certainly strengthen the model. But, it, but ha have you given any thought to what would make the, improve the model even more? 
believe me, I've given a lot of thought to it. So that's one of the reasons I suggested to the city manager that another person on board, because being in the interviews is key. And number two, we need policies and agreements with the police department, and we're working on that right now. Um, so those are, those are the two things I've given a lot of thought to, and the current staff is, is so professional and working so hard, uh, and we just need one or two more people like that, and San Jose will be very proud of their system of police oversight. And do you think that giving, you know, adding a component or a, 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 an ingredient of, in the, in the mind of the public, objectivity and independence as it relates to investigators within the IPA and the hybrid model, would that, wouldn't that enhance the model in your mind? Or, or? The, the model in my mind is muddled. Um, it would take so long to figure out the details. It, there's a back and forth I don't understand. I don't understand who would be overseeing what IPA does. I don't know what kind of investigators would come in. I don't know how you would coordinate that rare case when officer misconduct is also criminal, where civilians wouldn't have any authority over the criminal part of it or so I find it a muddled model. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with it that there are components of it that I don't fully understand, but, but I think we as a city need to choose to go down that road before we go sort of deconstruct it and figure out, okay, they're gonna do this and they don't do that and they investigate this. And so, but uh, anyway, so, so I, I, I appreciate your comments. I'll just leave everyone with this. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has any comments, but the, the, in, in the consultant report, they have a, a section that says rationale for recommendations. And it says this, allowing for more robust independent oversight and independent investigations when appropriate within the discretion of the IPA can help temper some perceptions that police officers investigating their peers, partners, and possible associates is a direct conflict of interest or at best subject to the perception of partiality. And so I think that is the spirit in which they recommend this model where you get a, a third party investigator, if you will, that would oversee some of these investigations. And so uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councilmember Councilman Cohen. Yeah, thank you. First, I just want to thank um, my colleague, Councilmember Jimenez, for his thoughtful input on this topic. Um, you know, he, he's been, I consider him my sort of expert on, on this over, over the years. He's, he's been here for this conversation, which is going on for a long time. This isn't something new. This is something that's been a question about how the city should proceed. And, and it's complicated to the point at which we always kind of to had a conversation and deferred it, had a conversation and deferred it, because we, I don't think any of us know what the right answer is to what the model, to a perfect model, and I don't think there is such a thing as a perfect model, but, you know, um, you know, many of the folks here haven't, weren't, haven't been on council on the previous conversations that we've had uh, over the years, and, and even conversations that were there before I came on council. Councilman Menez has been uh, part of those for a long time, so I, I, that's why I, you know, joined the group with him writing a memo that I thought, you know, had a lot of thought behind it. I also want to thank uh, our interim uh, IPA because I think actually having that fresh set of eyes now, somebody who has a lot of experience and is really good at this, to come in and say, and, and give us some perspective as to maybe how, how good our model really is because it was really hard for us to tell that before. And so I, I appreciate that and that, that helps give me some more confidence in, in what we're doing in the model we currently have and uh, you know, makes me think, let, let's, you know, let's, let's not continue to drag this conversation out longer than it needs to be, but let's try to figure out how to give the IPA the tools it needs to be more successful. I also wanna thank our you know, police department POA for being so cooperative in this whole process. I do think we have a model that works because our police department and our police officers care about oversight and care about accountability and work well with our IPA when the IPA office is, is functioning well. So uh, I wanna appreciate um, everybody in this part of this process in, you know, talking to me about it and in talking to all of us about it and helping us kind of get to a point where I think we can feel comfortable that we have a process that can work if it's resourced adequately and then we can move forward with with um, with figuring out how to you know how to maybe maybe adjust the policies procedures manuals and things that we need to make sure it does continue to work 
So, you know, even though I, again, like Council Member Foley, I was on the memo, I thought, you know, it made sense for us to sort of keep, think about it a little longer. I'm happy to support the motion on the floor and allow us to move forward from here. Great. Thank you, Council Member. And I think those are great comments for us to wrap up on. Good summary. I, I also want to thank all, everybody who's been engaged in this conversation now for quite a few years, including uh, City Manager's Office. Uh, I know, Karen, you're newer to the role, but I think you've really helped give us quite a bit of insight into how the process works and where we can optimize it. I uh, also want to thank the department and our bargaining unit, the, P the POA, for engaging in a robust conversation about how we continue to improve um, how, we, how we carry out these investigations and maintain public, public trust in the, in the process in the department. Um, I think we have exhausted all of the comments and questions. So, Tony, let's vote. I'm still waiting on one vote. We're still waiting on one vote. There we, there go. we go. We got it. Eight. Motion two. passes with Jimenez and Torres voting no. All right. We are, thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Okay. We are on to item 6.1, long-term renewable energy agreement with Sun Pond. There is no staff recommendation as I understand it, so we will go to public comment first. I have no cards or hands. Okay, back to the council. Colleagues, do we have any comments, questions, or a motion on item 6.1? Vice Mayor? Yeah, I just want to say that I had a great opportunity to meet with staff, and I'd like to move approval. Second. Great, thank you. Okay, not seeing any other hands, let's vote. Motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you. On to item 7.1, Beautify SJ Neighborhood Blight Reduction Status Report, one of my favorite topics. As, as, we, senior, as our senior staff is getting into position, yes. I'm gonna kick it off. Sure. Um, I just wanna say a few words as they're getting, in, getting ready. Um, as you know, the city has a long history and commitment to beautification and blight reduction efforts since the early 1980s when graffiti removal efforts started. Six years ago, with the launch of the Beautify SJ initiative, the city recommitted itself to galvanizing volunteers and neighborhood leaders to be a part of the solution for keeping our city clean. Through the years, and today with the city council's strategic investment in the last two fiscal years, the blight reduction team has grown to 44 full-time staff with several, several vendors and partners, all dedicated to enhancing the cleanliness of our streets, neighborhoods, and waterways. I'm very proud of our many departments and their staff who, with our interjurisdictional partners, address trash, dumping, and graffiti through prevention, eradication, and enforcement efforts. Today, we are gonna focus on those blight concerns, and we're not gonna be reporting on encampment services today, which will come to the council more comprehensively in the spring. Now I'd like to turn it over to John Cicerelli, our fearless PRNS leader, and the PRNS Beautify SJ team who lead and coordinate citywide cleanliness efforts to review last year's accomplishments. Thank you. All you, John. Thank you, City Manager. John Cicerelli, Director of Parks, Recreation, and Service, Neighborhood Services. Next to me is uh, Andrea Flores Shelton, our Deputy Director over Community Services, Olympia Williams, our Beautify SJ Division Manager, and Ed Ramirez, our Supervising Environmental Services Specialist. As the city manager said, we're here to talk to you about our blight programs. So that's graffiti, illegal dumping, neighborhood community cleanups, those sorts of things. It's not um, cleaning up encampments or doing abatements. As she said, we'll be back in the spring for those. So with that, we will talk about the last year and what our accomplishments are and what we're heading for in the future. Good evening, everyone, mayor, council members, and members of the public. My name is Olympia Williams, and I'm the Beautify SJ Division Manager. The Beautify SJ Neighborhood Blight Program Team continues to increase services and make strides towards beautifying our city by eradicating blight. While the new program, program structure has better aligned and consolidated programs to address blight, the program has an opportunity to continue to increase effectiveness by utilizing the comprehensive three E's approach 
that includes education, eradication, and enforcement. This best practice model is used by several large cities within the state of California and throughout the nation to combat blight and improve neighborhood livability and quality of life. In the three E's model, the education component helps to increase pride in one city, reduces blight by educating residents on how to address and combat blight, and would therefore reduce the need for increased eradication efforts. The enforcement component serves to also help reduce the need for eradication by holding those that would illegally dump or graffiti taggers accountable for their actions. This model uses a more balanced approach to delivering blight reduction and beautification services. Currently, 99% of all budgeted funds for Beautify SJ are directed towards eradication. To put it simply, the BSJ team has mastered the art of picking up trash and painting over graffiti. Knowing the importance of education efforts and the fight against blight, BSJ launched the BSJ Proud campaign. One-time funding in the 22-23 budget allowed the BSJ Proud campaign to reach nearly one million impressions through a multilingual education and outreach plan that used both traditional and digital media platforms to build awareness of neighborhood blight reduction programs, including graffiti removal, anti-litter efforts, neighborhood beautification efforts, and illegal dumping removal. The billboard seen here was in the first phase of the campaign launch. I would now like to turn it over to Ed Ramirez, who will discuss eradication and enforcement efforts. Mayor and Council, uh, the Beautify San Jose Neighborhood Blight Reduction Programs implemented strategies to improve eradication efforts and their response to reported issues of blight, as well as proactive monitoring and removal within neighborhoods. These efforts have resulted in the following. The graffiti removal program removed over 2.0 million square feet of graffiti citywide, a 14% increase in the past year. Our engagement strategies led to an increase in volunteer service hours, resulting in the collection of over 20,000 bags of trash and debris, collecting over 936,000 pounds. These service hours are extremely valuable contribution to the program's eradication efforts as a volunteer hour in California is currently valued at $31.80 per hour. The neighborhood blight reduction programs removed approximately 9.4 uh, million pounds of trash and debris citywide. This included over 7 million pounds of trash and debris collected by the RAPID team. 45% of overall incidents were completed through proactive monitoring, which is nearly double the efforts from the previous year. These are illegal dumping incidents not reported through the San Jose 311 Act. The dumpster day program increased the overall number of hosted events from 83 in the previous year to 96. The dumpster day program also implemented proactive cleanups of the participating neighborhoods to collect illegal dumping following each event. This contributed to 2.1 million pounds of debris collected by the program. The Beautify San Jose program is appreciative of all, of all key partnerships and we are con in constant communication with partners to address blight concerns. Beautify San Jose works closely with Caltrans, Union Pacific Railroad, Valley Water, and the County of Santa Clara, as well as three community-based organizations focused on the cleanup of our waterways. In addition to the BSJ Proud campaign, the Beautify SJ program had just two staff dedicated to education efforts in 22-23. This staff engaged with over 6,000 students across 44 schools, focusing on kindergarten through eighth grade age levels, introducing steps to prevent blight in their communities and how to report it. Their efforts also included 87 presentations at neighborhood association meetings citywide and by attending 38 resource fairs. In regards to enforcement, Beautify San Jose continues to work with code enforcement by vetting and forwarding evidence submitted by the public. The program continued to implement the use of deterrents such as surveillance cameras and no illegal dumping signage at identified hotspots citywide. The program bolstered deterrent efforts this year by adding new methods such as the installation of bollards, boulders, and solar powered motion sensor lighting where applicable. Moving forward, beautification and landscaping methods will be a part of the deterrent strategy against illegal dumping citywide and through the Clean Gateways pilot. 
for 22, for 2324, there are three key programs we'll be adding to further supplement our neighborhood engagement and beautification efforts and blight reduction. The first of these programs is Beautify Your Block, which is a pilot program that will focus on neighborhood engagement. This program will focus on engaging with neighborhood associations and groups to implement strategies to increase participation in cleanup efforts, provide workshops to educate neighborhoods on how to access city service, work to strengthen neighborhood association participation, and support implementation of the Beautify SJ neighborhood grants. Our Clean Gateways pilot is really focused on beautifying our gateway areas and corridors that lead into key city areas such as the downtown. This program will use beautification strategy as the main deterrent to welcome residents and guests into our main gateway areas. Instead of always using, think about bollards or fencing, we want to use decorative boulders and strategic plantings to reduce illegal dumping and access to areas that are typically graffiti. I would like to take this opportunity to thank those who are essential in the success of this program. First, Beautify SJ would not be successful without great leaders. Angel Rios, Cicerelli, and Neil move roadblocks, which allows the team to concentrate on delivering results. Ed Ramirez and Xochimontes ensure that our teams on the ground have what they need to best serve our residents daily. My boss, Andrea Flores Shelton, not only has a leadership style that has allowed us to thrive, but her deep commitment to serving our residents and increasing quality of life in our neighborhoods has led to these, an increase in our services. Mayor Matt has continued to be a champion for Beautify SJ and combating blight. Our council members and their staff have really helped us to amplify our efforts and reach into communities throughout the city to fight blight. Neighborhood, business associations, litter volunteers, and partner organizations and group groups, I am in awe of your continued volunteerism to make San Jose clean and beautiful. And to my BSJ team, my band of Greek Argonauts, I appreciate the work you do each day to beautify San Jose. None of this would be possible without you. With that, we are ready for questions. Great. Thank you. And just before we go to public comment, I just want to add my thanks. I, I joked it's one of my favorite topics, but really I am extremely grateful to our staff for the great work you all do. And it's been a privilege to partner with now, I think, each of my council colleagues at least once, although I think Councilmember Ortiz and I yep. hold the record for eight thus far in District 5 together. But every Saturday morning, you will find uh, some of my team and I out, and more importantly, a lot of volunteers out cleaning up the city. And I know that's just a subset of what our team is facilitating through partners across the city. It's been very impressive, and it's great to see the, the broadening of civic participation that we have rebounded and then gone beyond over 12,000, I think nearly 13,000 individuals who have come out and participated in, in one or another uh, cleanup or beautification activity. Also just have to give a shout out to the nonprofits who we partner with. Um, you mentioned uh, the Clean Creeks Coalition, the Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful, Trash Punks, and, and many other groups out there that just do a tremendous job so I could go on and on, but uh, let's hear from the public. Tony, do we have any comments? Yes, I have Sean and Jordan. Um, I just wanted to address, so this is the sweeps department, um, and we used to have meetings all the time between the housing department and the sweeps department. And the sweeps department got their feelings hurt and stopped having these meetings with us. And we've talked to housing and housing seems amenable to having these meetings. And the meetings were great because it was, what's going on, what are we seeing on the streets, what are you seeing on the streets, what are you seeing on the streets? And we would, we would be told, hey, there's a sweep coming up here. And then we'd go to your area and say, hey, you guys, you're about to get swept, how can we help, da 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 da. And then it was just, we don't want to talk to you anymore, our feelings got hurt, and the meetings ended. It would be great if those meetings started again. It was all the advocates and the sweeps department and the housing department. And now there's no communication, and that just seems a little bit ridiculous. If we would all talk to each other, it would help the people that we're trying to serve the most, which are the people who are outside. So if it would go back to having those meetings with the advocates, beautify, and housing, I think that would really, really help the people who are out there. We would be able to tell people, okay, you're gonna get swept, how can we help? How can we help move you? How can we help talk you into a tiny home? Whatever it might be, 
instead of now, it's just you find out about a sweep when you, somebody calls you or you happen to run into an area and stuff like that. So it would be much better if it went back to the other way, um, and that would be nice. Um, I, there are different stories of whether people are being swept humanely or inhumanely. Um, that's going to be an ongoing issue forever. Um, but it was done a lot better when it was previously under somebody who had a better relationship with people and treated them nicer um, and always had time to talk to people. Uh, but it would be great if we could get those meetings started again, a lot more collaboration. I think that would be a better way to go about things. Thank you. Next speaker. Jordan Muldow, District 3. I just wanted to thank Beautify SJ and the City Council and the Mayor for engaging with the residents of San Jose to, you know, work together with staff to help clean up the city. Um, and thanks to Beautify San Jose who brought the uh, free trash pickers to the State of the City event. Um, I brought mine to a cleanup at Bernal Park a few weeks ago with Councilmember Torres. Um, if you guys have any leftover trash pickers, I think it'd be great to bring them to more city events to give them out to more people um, or perhaps proactively reaching out to the various neighborhood associations to make sure that each neighborhood association has a few on hand so that they can run their own events without coordinating in advance with the city. Um, I don't know exactly how the adopt a part program works, but I got the impression from the event that they have to arrange in advance um, for the uh, green trash pickers and the trash bags. Uh, but if the neighborhood association already had some of their orange Beautify SJ trash pickers on hand, they could do it whenever they want, or people could just volunteer to pick them up from a community center and go walk around on their own. So yeah, consider giving out more trash pickers. Um, that's all, thank you. Gail. Hi, good evening, this is Gail. I'm just calling in support of Beautify San Jose. I have been to hundreds of abatements and cleanups and these staff members have been so respectful and um, to myself, and that's because I'm an old lady, and to the unhoused, most of the problems come from Tucker, but Beautify San Jose staff, if people aren't ready to move, they have helped them. Um, they have helped them put their um, belongings together. So um, I'm really in support of Beautify San Jose, not like some people. But um, I've seen them, the staff are wonderful. I want to comment on the public record somebody wrote in about Great Oaks. My council person, Mr. Um, Jimenez, council member Jimenez, was out there on a little Great Oaks. That's a camp I go to. They said there's a stretch of home of 2,000 people. Not true. This camp on Great Oaks, you can eat off the dirt, it's so clean. And Beautify comes by once a week, gives them bags. Um, yes, they do live by the track, but there's a fence. It's not gonna, it's not hurting anybody. And, but there's no outreach, really. There's nobody goes out there and offers them services since, or housing, since there isn't any housing or services. So the, there's no outreach efforts going out there. Some people have gotten housing through another woman that has been very involved out there. And um, also, this group has been together for a long time at different encampments. And I've been with them ever since um, ARCO. They've been debated three or four times. They've been together, like I've said many times, it's a family and other people have. Back to council. Great, thank you. And uh, just before I turn to my colleagues, I wanted to just make one point and ask one question. So I, I think we've really developed some great processes and now have staff capacity around eradication, as was noted. We can always do better, but I think we're getting better and better. 311's getting better. Residents are taking advantage of the, the services we provide. I'm feeling really good about that. Glad to see we're starting to invest more in education, though I would really encourage us to make sure that we're using evidence-based approaches and that we have some, some actual field research out there to indicate that as we spend more and more dollars there, that we're reaching the people we need to reach and that it's actually likely to change behavior. I frankly have some skepticism 
that the billboards are, are going to do that, but I think it's worth, it's worth a try. I understand the importance of setting expectations, creating a culture, et cetera, but uh, just would love to know if there is evidence-based research out there to support the methods we're using. The question I have, and I'll start it with a comment, is it feels to me that we have really underdeveloped and underinvested in the enforcement piece. And obviously we want to do that thoughtfully, but the truth is we have a small number of bad actors out there who are engaging in a level of very intentional law breaking that harms our community from illegal dumping to avoid, uh, typically I, I, I avoid doing the right thing and going, going to the dump, uh, even for haulers who have made a business out of basically uh, working around the system and not doing disposing of their materials properly, repeat graffiti artists who have taken it to a point of endangering public safety by covering up signs and doing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage. And I, I guess I just want to make the point and then, and then ask you all to comment on it. Uh, you know, where do you see the greatest opportunities? I know we're having some offline conversations with Caltrans and CHP and PD and others, but where do you see the greatest opportunities for this council to support targeted enforcement strategies that particularly on graffiti and illegal dumping can ensure that we're not creating a moral hazard around investing so much in eradication that we're just cleaning up after bad actors who are taking advantage of our community? So I'll start. I like to remind people up until about 2015, 16, we used to have a sergeant and officers that were assigned to the graffiti program. We used to have an average of about 600,000 square feet of graffiti a year. So to put that in context, or 2.9 million square feet. I can tell you best practices with all of the large cities and counties around us. They have a couple things. They have dedicated code officers. So you have someone who's investigating illegal dumping following up. They have the DA's office through their community prosecutors who will make sure that people get a fine or they have to do some type of restitution and volunteer service. Same thing with graffiti. They have dedicated officers that say, this is the night we're gonna go out and look for taggers. When we get someone, we hold them accountable, whether it's restitution or doing some type of volunteer service to pay their restitution. Those are the things that we just don't have built into our model at this time. Great, and can you comment on use of cameras? I saw just eight in the, in the presentation, which seemed like a very small number to me. Yeah, so I'll start with that. We have eight cameras around the city, and when we do find someone who has illegally dumped, we take that video, go through it, and make sure we get it over to our code enforcement um, department who actually does the um, citation. I do like to tell folks that people who dump are very smart because even when we have a camera, people often will cover up the license plate because we have a camera and a license plate reader, right? They'll cover up the side of the doors if they have any kind of business name on there. So what we typically find is the person is dumped. We know exactly where to go pick up the debris, but we don't have much else. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate you highlighting a few things that we're seeing DAs, PDs, others uh, do in other cities. I, I look forward to continuing this conversation as we get into the budget cycle next year. I think we are going to need to invest more in enforcement to hold people accountable so that we don't have to continue to see usage and cost escalation in the double digits every year on the eradication front. Once again, want to thank staff, our partners, all of my colleagues who have really rolled up their sleeves and been working to eradicate blight in their districts. And also want to thank council members Candelas and Ortiz for the group memo. I'll let them speak to that, but appreciated collaborating with them on that. So let me go to council member Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate your comments. I also want to share a uh, deep gratitude and thank you to the staff of Beautify SJ for the important work that you do every day, but also the great report uh, on a major quality of life issue that is impacting our city. Um, the work of the Beautify SJ team is incredibly impactful, um, and residents report that interactions with the teams are among the most positive, especially at, at dumpster days, um, or one of our eight cleanups that I've done with the mayor, uh, and the Caltrain Freeway uh, cleanups. Um, and my team also appreciates the support, um, be it at one of our monthly cleanups or helping address those hot spots uh, of illegal dumping in, in East San Jose. Uh, to that end, I was happy to work with the mayor and council member Candelas to put forward our memo, um, which moves us in a direction uh, of collaboration. 
Uh, far too often we're stuck pointing fingers about whose job it is to address blight in our neighborhoods. Um, is it the city, the county, Caltrans, VTA? Um, though ultimately our residents don't care whose job it is, right? All they want to do is live in a clean and beautiful city. Um, uh, in short, our memo was about breaking down silos uh, in government and finding the space for partnerships because ultimately uh, we all serve the same residents. Taking it back to the report, I really appreciate the move towards a proactive approach, especially in those areas of our city where neighbors are doing their due diligence in reporting and even trying to catch illegal dumpers in the act. I asked this question during uh, the NSE meeting and think it may be a value for the Greater Council to hear, um, especially considering the recent news article which raised the question of, is our program contributing to a culture of more illegal dumping, quote unquote. Uh, in terms of education, um, have we considered the installation of signage that teaches folks that there are options instead of just illegal dumping. And for example, not to be prescriptive, but I could picture some sort of signage with a QR code to download 311 um, or have the number on, on the uh, signage of how to get uh, the junk picked up. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Ortiz, um, for your support and your question. Um, yeah, what we do want to consider based on your feedback at committee as we look at our um, remaining deterrent budget and look at different strategies, mm -hmm. always looking for innovative, creative ways um, to get the word out, um, and also through our BSJ Proud campaign. How can we um, ensure whether it's um, in our multilingual uh, way or through technology, through the QR code, that we're driving people to ways um, that they can get involved um, and or report. So um, we'll great. be looking at um, those ways to, and I, I just wanna thank Ed and his team, whether um, it's at the Cape Horn area and D4 or some of these other areas where we've been really trying to get at um, illegal dumping. Um, we've been putting up signs in many That's places, great. but to your point, they're simply saying, you know, no illegal, no dumping, illegal dumping and there's yeah. a fine. So we'll look into sort of making that a more robust sign in the future. I just really love the idea of putting out uh, anti-illegal dumping propaganda, <laughs> really like hammering it home into our, our residents. Sorry, I saw you were gonna speak. Were you? Yeah. I was actually just going to add, we do uh, local, very localized when we're seeing illegal dumping in a neighborhood consistently. We do hand out the flyers about the junk program and that oh, you can great. call for junk pickup. You know, sadly, that program takes a little time to do it, and I think that's part of our issue. Mm -hmm. So we are in discussions with ESD where that program goes through, right, goes through our trash haulers. On, we all recognize this is a problem, and, how to, and the question is how do you solve it and how do you change that sort of learned behavior, if you will, that we've kind of taught people that we're gonna come quickly and pick it up. Um, mm -hmm. And if you look at the illegal dumping metrics, they're good. Um, we're, we're good at doing it quickly, especially all the hot spots. I think if you read the report, something like 50% or so are proactively picked up. We don't even need a 311 call. We know, where, we know where this happens in a lot of places, so we automatically go there every week to pick it up because we know things are gonna show up. So those are kind of the more localized things, but it is a difficult behavior change that we're trying yeah. to figure out on the yeah. back end. Yeah, the hard part, what I've seen is I have specific neighborhoods that are like in the corners, places where nobody looks, and people drive there to dump. It's not necessarily the neighborhoods or, or the residents. Um, maybe somebody moving out of their apartment and they have a whole bunch of stuff they want to get rid of, or like the mayor said, contractors who you know aren't, aren't doing their, their due diligence. Um, I, I remember when, before I took office, there was like a mailer sent to uh, all the homes in regards to like how to properly recycle or how to like make sure you're you're not putting you know garbage in your recycling or something like that. Have we thought about doing a mailer similar to like uh, similar to the, the to this, but about illegal dumping? I think that's where we partner with ESD, okay. um, right? Because that's where we get to um, our businesses as well as our residents who you know what we have what we do think is one of the reasons is also just the cost of going to the dump, right? So there are all sorts of ways that we can get the word out and we can partner with ESD on Correct. potentially doing a mailer. 
wonderful. And then finally, I did hear that there was a commercial in the works, bringing back Keep It Clean Jean and All Star Stan. How, do we have any progress? Olympia's dream, yes. Oh, okay. um, and I know our PRNS comms team is is looking okay. into that. I'm, so. I'm excited for that because that part was of the really, propaganda. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was that was really hammered into me as a as a kid. You know, if I was even in school, I remember telling kids, "Oh, don't be a littering Lucy." So, you know, I, it worked for for me and my friends. But um, thank you for you know your thoughtful answers again. Thank you for doing really important work for our, our, our residents. You know, the number one thing they say in my district is blight and cleaning up the district, so thank you. And with that, I'd like to move the memo written by Mayor Mahan, Councilmember Candelis, and myself. Thank you, Councilmember. And that memo does include the staff recommendation, just if anyone's curious, but thank you, Councilmember Ortiz, appreciate that. Councilmember Candelis. Uh, thank you, Mayor, um, and thanks, staff, for the presentation. I, you know, I, before I touch on the on the memo we, we wrote, um, I wanted to give a sincere thanks to the Be Beautify SJ team. I know um, the BSJ Proud campaign, and I know it's been you know a great educational model. You know, I've seen I've seen you all out at the schools, at the resource fairs, or at one of the 23 different cleanups that I've done, or nine dumpster days since I took office. Uh, nearly 550 bags of garbage, or over 200 tons of garbage, by my estimations. It's, you know, it's just throwing that out there, but you know, with, <laughs> with the educational aspect of our approach, you know, uh, it's my hope that we can it, uh, incorporate, you know, some, some sort of how to use 311 app. I think, I think there's, there's an appetite for that within our community because, I, uh, you know, as easy it, as it is for us, I think that's still an opportunity for us to, to better connect with, with, with folks because I still get plenty of calls from my office saying, hey, can you, can you remove um, you know, this, this mattress that's on the sidewalk or, or they, they, they text me directly, my residents, which is great, but I think there's an opportunity to find some efficiencies there. Um, and then uh, there was a, a question, uh, the mayor posed a great question with regards to, you know, uh, graffiti and or um, some enforcement mechanisms. And I know a few years ago, um, the California Highway Patrol had a task force set up specifically to, to try to catch some of those um, uh, prolific uh, artists, street artists, if you will, uh, that tagged up the overpasses. And, and, and I, we've, all, we've all seen an influx in that. So I'm curious to, to see what Beautify SJ's uh, opinion is with regards to engaging, you know, folks who have, uh, you know, jurisdiction over Caltrans, the freeways and the Highway Patrol. Council member, we meet with Caltrans every other Thursday and we have been engaged with them with the CHP in doing that project. They're looking at doing something in 2024 for the Bay Area. So we've asked them to include it. They're looking at doing a San Jose, San Francisco, Oakland because too late has become very popular in the area. So that's one person they're looking at and there's a few other folks that they have on the list. But it's something that we have been asking for. I'm just going to say our challenge is that once taggers are caught, we need to make sure that people are paying some type of restitution, whether it's cash or doing some type of volunteer service. No, without question. And I think uh, integral to, to having, you know, the, the, the CHP, it's conversations with the district attorney's office. So they, so they know that we are working on this and, you know, um, uh, with regards to restitution and or some, some sort of remediation with with the folks who are who are actually doing it, uh, whether it's community service, we always need volunteers for the the cleanups that we do. So, make, making sure that we loop fo the, the the district attorney's office into these conversations, or the CHP with the meetings with Caltrans, because uh, they may or may not be present, I think is a, is is a good op a way to operationalize and get some efficiencies out of this. Um, you know, um, next on the on the memo that written by the, my colleagues and I. You know, I wanted to provide some, some color and some context. About a decade ago, state law actually changed and transferred those sound wall barriers and similar infrastructures back to our local jurisdictions. Um, and so for the better part of a decade, most of these infrastructures were, were not funded. So because of uh, money in, in programs like STIP or the State Transportation Improvement Program, we are now able through VTA build these sound walls in historically disadvantaged communities and corridors. And so this is an issue that we're gonna see more and more on whose responsibility it is after VTA, for example, builds the sound wall, who's gonna maintain it. So I appreciate the collaboration effort and, uh, and, and staff working with the mayor, Councilmember Ortiz in my office to try to figure out how we can 
um, uh, figure out a solution and I look forward to hearing back on conversations with the, a memorandum of agreement or understanding to, to that effect because I know that's going to be a responsibility that is going to be shifting. Um, and so um, while, while we're all glad to see, you know, sound barriers go up, it's very disheartening to see beautiful <laughs> sound walls then get uh, uh, street, street art on them, for the lack of a better term. So I look forward to, to, to collaborating and look forward to hearing the report. Thank you. Great. Thank you, council member. And completely agree on engaging the DA. And I, I have reached out to him and we, we have an assurance that they will prosecute, but I think we need, to your point, to formalize uh, a process with, with all the agencies involved. So I know that's in the works, but appreciate that point. Council Member Torres. Was that from the last item? No. Oh, you're up. Okay, all go right. ahead. No, I just, I wanted to say uh, thank you to uh, Beautify SJ. I think it's, uh, this type of work is uh, extremely important as as other council members have said, right, these, our neighbors want clean, clean streets, clean parks, clean, clean neighborhoods, et cetera, right? And it actually starts with, with all of us. I think many of us on this council got started by, you know, being a neighborhood activist and going to that first community cleanup, right? That's super exciting. Uh, and so that's why these, these programs are, are extremely important. But I, I just wanted to, one, uh, say thank you, but also I know that I've mentioned it on NSE and I've mentioned it more than a few times, um, but I have a very, very busy corner in, in my district, right, on Julian Street, right before the 101, right across the street from, from those businesses. I think it's North 26th or 27th and East Julian, uh, and so, you know, when there's a well, also 10th Street and 11th Street and whatnot. Um, but if uh, we can keep an eye on, on that little corner, that will be great because I see a mattress and two hours later I come back and it's like a castle of illegally dumb stuff. So, great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, Councilmember Batra. The fact that we have named Beautify SJ as a department, allocated people, allocated budget, sends a very strong and clear message that we are wanting our city to be clean, beautiful. So thank you very much for that. Okay. Now, did I hear that you calculated the volunteer value at $31.80? Yes, that is correct. That's per okay. hour, per okay. volunteer. Now, Mayor and I were at a volunteer recognition event, and one of the things I told the volunteers, that they were priceless. <laughs> so I'm not too sure <laughs> that I want the $31.80 price to be communicated to them. <laughs> but I appreciate that you are trying to keep track of the hours the volunteers are giving. And I think in my mind, they're still priceless, okay. Um, they're, they are priceless to us, that's for sure. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Uh, now, in terms of your proactive monitoring, so you have two jobs, proactive monitoring and then removing or taking care of whatever you happen. My hope is, that the pilot project we are about to start, which you are part of uh, with the IT, automatic detection of these objects, uh, the AI pilot, which is supposed to go on in next some couple of months. And I'm hoping that that pilot is going to be so successful that we'll be able to get away from manual detection of these potholes and uh, the illegal dumping and trash and all those kind of things. In a few months, maybe a year, we would not have to spend any energy on detection work. And detection and automated reporting into 311 with that uh, 
IT systems to be able to pick up those problems. And all of our resources at that point should be going into actually taking care of the problem, okay? That's my optimistic feeling, that we will be able to take our job that way and would not have to put in more and more resources into that one. So I'm hoping that that pilot will be extremely successful and uh, we'll get away from that. In dumpster days, which I have held in my, through my staff, uh, one of the recent requests I've gone is that it's okay for you to do this furniture thing and they love it uh, and there's a lot of trash brought there. And some of it brought by the contractors, but I don't know for sure, but we need to check on that one. But one of the uh, groups came and asked, hey, can you have one of the dumpster to be at least an e-waste dumpster, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and we didn't have the answer, so I'd like to work with you how to add into, like we have five, six dumpster. I'd like to have one of them to be an e-waste dumpster. How to get that done, what legal ramifications there are or not. And the second request I got was the expired medicines, et cetera, People hang on to them forever and then they dispose it off in the garbage, which is not the right place. So help us figure out something in that area, how we should make that part of the cleanliness thing, okay? So those are my requests and needs, which I learned from my uh, constituents. Otherwise, everything you are doing, we just need more of it. And thank you very much for taking care of the city the way we are, and we have to have our cities, San Jose beautiful. And Mayor, I appreciate all the volunteerism you started in that area, and I inherited some of those volunteers. I continue to cherish them and work with them. Okay. Great, well thank you for doing that, Council Member, and it's certainly been a long, thank long you. legacy that predates me as well. Thank um, you. Great, thank you. Okay, Councilor Dwan. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, staff. From our council member to the mayor, uh, from our citizen out there, thank you for your hard work and, and beautifying our community. And I, I can't count how many times I've gone out there and do cleanup, and, and not only in my district, but in other districts as well. And I think all of us here um, agree that having our city clean and less blight and less graffiti, it, it shows the pride within our community. Ha, I, you, I think the enforcement part about illegal dumping, I know that th they're getting pretty sharp at it, but I think somewhere code enforcement hopefully will, will catch one or two and then we can publicize that on to um, you know, our social media or the newspaper if, if that, saying that we, we no lo longer tolerate um, illegal dumping in, in San Jose. We have many homeless encampment in our creeks and, and many other areas. <clears throat> have you ever thought about putting a, a small dumpster uh, in, in like, for example, uh, Tolly Library, you know, the, the, the creek area? Some of the unhoused residents that I walked down there and talked to, they, they would be more than happy to manage just a small dumpster per week so they can pick up the garbage, have unhoused, other unhoused residents throw the garbage into that particular container to keep the area clean. Thank you, council member, um, for the question. Um, as you know, we do provide the, uh, the weekly trash service um, and, and along our waterways, that will be increasing um, to three days a week. Um, what we have found is that by putting out dumpsters, um, while we, of course, expect people to use it um, the way they're supposed to, it unfortunately attracts illegal dumping. So when our hauler comes out to remove a dumpster that we have scheduled and placed out there for these type of purposes, they can't 
they can't empty it because it's surrounded by garbage. Um, so we have had these in other places where the, we then have to send out the beautify team to go pick up all the garbage that's surrounding the dumpster so that then the hauler can take the dumpster away, which may not even be filled. And sometimes they're you know, overloaded. So it ends up not really getting at the objective, which is cleanliness. As I understand that, but um, some, some area I, I think there's a hierarchy of uh, unhoused residents, if you will. And, and they have asked me and they, they would, and made promises that they would monitor and control the area. And, and let's say that when it's overloaded or overfilled, they'll, they'll move the, the garbage bag out of the way so that way the, the truck can pick it up. And some of these areas are, um, is unaccessible by vehicle, if you will. So I would imagine um, someone who really want to be um, illegally dumping have to travel into a, an area that's surrounded by our unhoused residents. And, and um, I think it might deter some, but um, I, I would hope that we, we try again and just in hope that some of our unhoused residents can, can help us monitor and, and, and keep the area clean because I, I've got the tall libraries and many other residents around that area um, starting to complain that, you know, because of the garbage out there, there's huge amount of infestation of rats uh, had slowly creeping onto the neighborhoods, and, and that, that is one of my concerns. On the other hand, I, I do have a, um, do appreciate that Council Member Ortiz did mention about the mailers. Um, if, if you collaborate with the, or recycling, to put out the message, not only um, the proper way to recycle, but also you can use 311 for the one-time pickup. And I, I, think, I, I think that those um, recyclers would be more than happy to collaborate, so that way we can reduce our cost of sending it out to, to our residents. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I would envision council member with the SD putting it in the bills and the mailers and the bills and things like that. So they, they have all these addresses all over the city that you can get to. It's probably an effective way at least to try. Uh, again, it's a behavior change kind of campaign. So sometimes you've got to look for ways other than just a sign or a flyer or those kind of things. People sometimes aren't looking at those or they're not inspired by them enough. Um, uh, to do it. That's why we were just saying, you know, we thought putting dumpsters around homeless encampments might make sense, but in the end it didn't, um, which is why we stopped doing it. Um, it made more work for us, not less. It made more trash, not less. Now, you could argue that trash is going to end up somewhere else in the city. That's probably true. Um, but we're certainly creating a magnet. I'll tell you, people who live near there don't like what happens um, when, when everybody else starts coming by to pile up trash and Big, and it's a lot of big stuff too, you know, chairs and couches and washers and dryers, all that good stuff. So it's a difficult problem. We don't have great answers for it. Again, because it's human behavior, it's very problematic to figure out. Yeah, I, I, I hear you and I, I remember there, there used to be, um, you know, small dumpster, not the large dumpster. Um, and, and I walk that area and I drive by almost every single day. So I haven't noticed any large appliance stuff out items, I see a lot of garbage bag. So uh, I would hope we, we, we give it a, another shot, uh, specifically in that uh, Coyote Creek area. Um, the, the other part I'm asking is, is that I, I've gone out there to um, seen the um, Beautify San Jose cleanup and also abatement. And, and I noticed that there's only one truck. And so, you got a bunch of employees, you got one truck, load up the truck, and the truck has to go to a dump versus a second truck pull up, and it's kind of like a domino effect, a, a continuous process. Um, have you looked at funding for another dump, uh, dump truck, or uh, is it I can work with you to uh, perhaps to, to get a donation from a, one of the larger uh, you know, um, company out there um, that willing to support us. Yes, council member, th this is a problem that's frustrating for us as well. We have a backlog, I think, of 14 or so vehicles on order right now that we can't get. You know, we have a lot of supply chain issues going on in, in this country. 
we're leasing vehicles to try to make a difference. It's a very expensive way for us to try to solve that problem, but just so we can put people on the street. Um, if we had all our vehicles, that might make some more sense if we knew we were going into a big area. But right now, if we took a bunch of vehicles and went to one area, that means other areas don't get it. So we're kind of trapped a little bit while we're waiting for vehicles to push through a pipeline. We have funding to buy them all. We have them on order. It's just a problem with the pipeline. Well, thank you. And, and I just want to say again, you know, from, from the citizen to our council member and the mayor, we, we, we thank you for, for all the work that you do. Thank you. Thanks, council member. Appreciate that. Vice Mayor? Thank you very much. I also wanted to extend my thank you to the entire team. Uh, you do such important work, and, um, you know, it's complex. We know that. Uh, and you are always responsive. I mean, I um, have heard so many good things. You know, sometimes it takes a little bit of time, but I will say that uh, it's just incredible. So I think that on behalf of, you know, uh, all of us, I think, uh, really thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, yep. Once again, thank you for the great work, great report. I think we got to everybody and exhausted that issue. Look forward to continuing the conversation offline and we're ready to vote. Motion passes unanimously with Cohen absent. Okay, great. And to our public commenter, Jordan, I, I failed to note, we will follow up with some more litter sticks. Your council member and I are going to make sure you get all the litter sticks you need. Okay, we are on to open forum, which is an opportunity for members of the public to comment on city business that was not on today's agenda. Tony, do we have comment? Yes, yes I have Jordan and Steve. Jordan Muldow, District 3. I wanted to thank you for the proclamation for the World Day of Remembrance um, and just speak a little bit more to that. Um, you know, there's been, unfortunately, too many people who have been killed on our roadways and even more who have been injured or have near misses. Um, so thanks for the proclamation. I hope we can all together work to get results as quickly as possible. Um, I thank Gina for her comments and for being here and for urging everyone to work to get the speed enforcement cameras in place next year. Uh, I'd like to similarly urge to try and get the AB361 cameras for identifying cars parked in bike lanes also delivered hopefully sometime next year as well. Um, that'll be really important for our bicyclist community who sees cars parked in the bike lane an unfortunate amount of time. Um, and it can be a, a virtuous or a vicious cycle depending on which way you look at it. If our streets are safer, then more people will want to walk and bike instead of being in cars. Then there'll be less cars and less traffic accidents, and it'll be safer, and more people will walk and bike. Um, and of course, the reverse is true as well. Um, when people are parking in bike lanes or leaving their trash in bike lanes, um, it sends the message that I can't safely be on the street or I can't send my kids to school on a bike um, because they're going to have to be weaving around all these obstacles. Um, so I hope everyone in the city can work towards doing everything they can possibly do to close the loop on this as quickly as possible. If we can somehow tighten the loop between the Vision Zero Task Force, t &E, City Council, BPAC, so that they can have conversations in a tighter loop and get things delivered uh, more quickly. Um, some of our cyclists are asking for more options in 311 for reporting issues. Um, I did hear there's going to be a new function in March for reporting cars parked in bike lanes, but there's lots of other things that block bike lanes all the time that we need to be able to report so that there can be follow-up action. Thank you, next speaker. Good evening, uh, Steve Cohen. Uh, I'm a 33 year resident of District 3. I have five properties in District 3, 40 year residents in San Jose. Um, I need the help of the mayor's office and of the city manager. Um, 
The Department of Transportation refuses to do any public outreach as far as the bike lanes and the road diets. Uh, there was a meeting in, a Zoom meeting in April for two small projects and they did, I got one postcard for a 10 unit building and no one else got anything for two blocks. Uh, I, there were 23 attendees at one of the meetings on Zoom, five of which were staff. They promised me another meeting in June. I got nothing. I spoke with uh, Mike Brillo, and Mike Brillo said that we did meetings six years ago for the bike lanes, and that's enough. It's not just District 3. It's through the city. Uh, I'm on a lot of the neighborhood emails. They just did another project on Lee and Del Rose Avenue, where they changed it from one lane to two lane. People that live on a blind curve had no idea what was going on, and I'm not even sure how that ended up. They, all they know is they changed our roads, they changed our markings. Uh, I've dealt with Mike Ryan, who promised me a meeting in June. I got nothing. Uh, this is now almost the end of the year. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. I contacted Nathan Weinstein, May, June, and July, eight different emails back and forth. He said, I'll get back to you. I heard nothing from him. Uh, the last I got was Jessica Zenke, who said that, oh, don't worry about it because we're already going to contract. And I'm like, how can you go to contract? You haven't done any public outreach. Thank you, Sean. I have two things and they're about access, maybe equity. So every time that I need to get validated, tell me I'm pretty and that you like me and I'm smart. But every time that I need to get validated, I need somebody else, security guard or police, to go up to the top and do it because I come in through the disabled entrance. There should be a way to get validated down here. I shouldn't have to be reliant on these two options. So right now, he's guarding that spot He's guarding that spot. I have to wait until there's somebody to do this for me. And I'm always reliant on somebody to do this for me. So I'm just bringing up an issue of access again. It's got to be like five years I've pointed this out. Um, secondly, police have been really enforcing vehicles on uh, roads, like in the parks and stuff like that. I understand. But I also think that there should be a way for you guys to come up with some sort of placard that those of us who feed unhoused people, bring them tents and tarps and sleeping bags, uh, that some sort of placard that we can be there. I, I, others have been out there for years and you know we haven't run any, over anybody yet, but especially in inclement weather, we are bringing them necessary supplies. We're bringing them nourishment, things that keep them warm and things that keep them dry, especially during winter. There's no reason that we should be getting harassed multiple times. It's like, you're the cop that knows me. Stop hassling us, especially when you know like who we are. Like we have, you know who we are. There's something on the door. We can give you a card, whatever it is. So hopefully you guys can come up with some sort of memo that says these people with this sort of placard that you guys come up with have access. Because if it's a good cop, they hassle you and then they go, oh, okay, I know what you're doing. Thank you. It's good. That's great. If it's a bad cop, they make you leave. And now you didn't feed people. You didn't give them tents, tarps, sleeping bags, whatever it is. And you can't bring it in on. Back to council. Right. Thank you all. Have a great evening. We're adjourned. <laughs>